And good Thursday morning to you. I am Paul Bloom live in our Fox 9 streaming center. We are approaching 8.03 a.m. Thursday morning. You can see Judge Michael Waterman is on his bench. What we are waiting for is the jury. They are here to watch the cell phone video again. Let's take you out. We are back on the record in state of Wisconsin versus Nikolai Mew. Uh, The attorneys are both both sides of the attorneys are present. Mr. Mew is present. 12 jurors are present. Um, When we left off yesterday, uh, we were told that the jury wanted to uh, view a portion of the uh, Juwan Cockfield video again. Um, Mr. Anderson, do you have it queued up? Yes. Mr. Trophacy, you or Mr. Nelson, you all consulted about the right spot to start from? We did, Judge. Perfect. Um, Let's get up the monitor and then you can hit play. Monitors working for everyone? Yeah. Okay. Please begin. Oh, sorry. <clears throat> you can take it down. I gotta reboot it. Please stop, we don't have audio. Anybody need to see it again? Okay, I'm seeing no indications. Um, please take the jury out. Please continue your deliberations. All rise for the jury. <clears throat> Is there anything else for the record while we're assembled? No. All right, that's all. We are in recess.
And good morning again from our Fox 9 streaming center. You are watching our live gavel to gavel coverage of the Apple River stabbing trial from Hudson, Wisconsin. Uh, the parties there uh, in court for just a brief uh, few minutes. Uh, what had happened late yesterday, uh, the jury had asked the judge, the court, uh, to rewatch the Juwan Cockfield cell phone video. They also asked uh, to adjourn for the afternoon uh, yesterday. Obviously, a, a long day. They sat through closing arguments. Uh, so far, eight days of trial, so they'd asked to adjourn, but they did want to see that cell phone video. Uh, so what the court did is they sent the jury home and then began a uh, Thursday morning right there uh, watching the Cockfield video. Uh, I would point out that uh, that video runs about three minutes, 20 seconds in total, but this jury specifically wanted to watch the 10 seconds uh, before the physical confrontation between Nikolai Miu and Madison Cohen on the river. That is the blonde woman, all of that uh, witness testimony that came in, who pushed who first, who touched who. Madison Cohen is in uh, Nikolai Miu's um, uh, space, personal space. Uh, he, he alleges that she put hands on him. Uh, obviously, we've heard the testimony from uh, the Carlson brothers, others, uh, the friends of Isaac Schumann. Uh, that Nikolai Miu clearly punched, slapped, struck, hit uh, Madison Cohen, and that's what really ignited uh, the physical altercation beyond the yelling and the, the mockery and the taunting, if you will. It was that physical confrontation between Nikolai Miu and Madison Cohen uh, that ignited it, and clearly this jury is focusing in on what they want to watch. They don't want to see the entirety of it. They want to watch from 10 seconds before the encounter to right after the stabbings occur. Uh, with that, let me take a look at our graphic just so you know who is deliberating today. We began uh, with a jury panel of 14 uh, yesterday. Uh, you can see the judge sent home two male alternates. Uh, so we are now at a six, six uh, gender uh, dynamic on that uh, jury, six and six, two men uh, sent home, one in their 40s, one in their 60s. I, I do, if you weren't with us yesterday, I want to point out what they're doing over in Wisconsin, a little different than uh, what I'm familiar with here in Minnesota when it comes to alternate jurors uh, trial. But these alternates still remain on standby. Uh, they are uh, at home or at work, but are not to be watching you know, us, not to be watching the news, not to be connecting on social media, not to be talking about the case. And should something happen to one of your 12 jurors, they would then come back and jump in on deliberations at some point. Uh, but again, your dynamic there, uh, the jury dynamic uh, there, and you look at the ages, uh, you have, uh, what, five in their 20s to 40s, and then uh, six, seven uh, more peers of Nikolai Miu, you, you would say, in their 50s, Miu now 54, he's 52 at the time, and what life experience is how, and how you process what you see and what you've heard during this trial. Uh, you've got seven, so a little bit of a major majority there, uh, more in Nikolai Miu's uh, potential to maybe see it through his eyes a little more or a little better. As I uh, t head over now to our legal analyst, Marsh Hallberg, Hallberg Criminal Defense, uh, kind enough to join us this morning. We're going to break down some of the things we've watched and heard. I would just uh, add, by my best math, uh, the jury got the case around 1230 yesterday afternoon. They went home at 430. There was lunch. There was, uh, you know, time to get in and out of the court. But I would, I would think they put in about three hours of jury deliberations yesterday as they begin their second day of deliberating Nikolai Miu's fate. Marsh, I just start with, uh, with you saying good morning. Thank you for joining us. The thought that this jury wants to rewatch, and this is the second time that they've asked to rewatch the video, and specifically that area in and around the confrontation between Miu and that first physical, you know, spark, if you will. What do you make of it? Well, I think part of that's due to the. I think the defense did a really good job in their closing about you know talking about labeling Madison right, Queen of the River, kind of derogatory, and saying. Look at other objective things you can look at to try to determine if you really hit her. Did she have bruising? No. Did she fall down? No. Did she drop her drink? No. All these other things. So I think that at least to at least one juror, if not more, uh, has caused them to say, I really want to focus in, focus in on that more for what's happened. Marsh, we weren't sure if they were going to have their own access to the video, just it had not come up specifically. And I know things operate differently in different courtrooms. Sometimes the parties agree. The judge sets, you know, what type of evidence or what type of physical uh, material from the trial the jury gets. I know more familiar uh, with, with kind of the metro counties, maybe more 
technologically advanced or uh, larger budgets. But I, I know sometimes uh, juries will go back with like a video player or a laptop and a thumb drive. Clearly here they have to come back into court to watch. Uh, what do you make of that? You know, kind of a big difference from Minnesota, right? In, uh, what happened in Minnesota just a few years back, there's a test program in Hennepin County that then expanded statewide. That now in Minnesota, generally, when you have electronics like that, uh, video clips, et cetera, those go back into the uh, jury room. It used to be all they got was the, the electronics, but no player for it. They'd get the DVD or whatever. Now they get a player. So in Minnesota, they can play it over and over and over again. They can stop things. They can rewind. Maybe they can go slow-mo. They can do whatever they want. So it's a lot different than Wisconsin where they have to come out each individual time, which, uh, you know, generally, you know, common sense will tell you that'll really limit or make it a deterrent for jurors to want to come back and watch things. The argument about not allowing the jurors to have their own player is that you'd argue that why should some evidence in a case get better treatment than other evidence? Other witnesses don't get to go back into the jury room and say their statements over and over and over again. So why should a, a video that in effect is a form of evidence get to be played over and over and over again? So that's kind of the argument that was against it. In this case, both sides have really said, we're so grateful the video exists, right? So they can argue that they wanted it to go back. And obviously they have uh, they have access to the hard exhibits. So meaning all of those still frames that we watch frame by frame, I think it says something that they want to see that video in real time. They need to process what was going through Nikolai Miu's mind at that time. And clearly the video matters. It, it's it's it, I said early on, right? It's the video versus his testimony. If we you dummy this whole thing down, and I think you know I think viewers that have watched this thing for the last week or so kind of start to understand what trial lawyers understand, that in the moment, some little question, some detail may seem like a big thing and there may be objections and fights over the exact word that is used. But after everybody kind of calms down, takes a breath, steps away for a night, comes back the next day, all those little kind of details to a great extent may just fall apart. People around here get sick of me saying, keep it simple, stupid, but that's my trial strategy. You boil it down to some basics and you hit it over and over again. And you told me the other day when you're on with us, it's the video and it's his testimony. Where does it uh, net out? I'm just curious. I, I'm not trying to build a, the, the, any sympathy here for, for our defendant, uh, but he sat there, uh, the camera, the, the way the, the photographer shot that moment where they're watching the video, he's there. You saw him bow his head a couple times. You saw his defense attorney, Aaron Nelson, put his uh, arm around his back or give him a little pat there. Just on the human front, Marsh, you represent uh, people who, who, who are on trial and then and, and use on trial in essence for his life. He goes to prison for life if convicted on the top count. The human angle in that in that room between attorney and, and defendant at this point in a trial waiting on a, on a jury, what is that like? Very important. Uh, again, uh, you can argue whether this is a good or bad thing, but there's a certain amount of optics and theater that's in a courtroom. And jurors really do see that, or at least collectively, they see a lot of things. So I, I kind of warn or tell my clients, look, I'm going to put my hand up on your shoulder and, and talk with you in front of the jury. I want to make sure they see that, that they know I'm not repulsed by you. I'm not sitting five feet away from you at the counsel table, that I like you. I, I'll even, again, a little trial trick sometimes when a jurors are coming in, I'll be turning around talking to, you know, maybe the parents, right, that are in the front row. And I want to make sure the I can't say anything to the jurors, but I can make it clear to them these are connected to this case. These are likely the parents, as you figured out, if they didn't know from testimony, for example. So you do things to try and uh, tie the human element in with that, with the with your client. Marsh Hallberg, Trial 101 Optics. I feel like I'm just sitting in your uh, law school class. I appreciate that, uh, that insight. What I want to do now is call up all of the charges, right? This jury deliberated three hours. We have no idea how long they are going to go. The state uh, in the last... Uh, uh, 48 hours added what we were calling lesser included. We came in here with the top count being uh, first degree intentional homicide in the murder of uh, the alleged uh, murder of Isaac Schumann. Uh, they have since added the second degree intentional homicide as well as the reckless homicide counts. Marsh, um, just on these murder counts alone, there are four choices now running the gamut. As in, in the best way to produce it, I, I recognize you, you don't necessarily try a case over there in Wisconsin, but if you could loosely describe the difference between an intentional act versus a reckless act here. Right. So people, you know, obviously we talk about premeditated murder, you know, uh, developing an intentional act within your mind. 
intent can be formed in a, in a second. You don't have to plan for weeks or overnight to, to kill, kill somebody. You can form that intent in a moment, that it's a conscious act by you intended to occur. Versus reckless is just that, a, it's reckless disregard for the rights and safety of others, some kind of extreme conduct that then is, that takes away that intentional act but puts you to a recklessness. A lot of times we might think of, you know, Reckless driving, driving 100 miles an hour in a 30 zone, right? Well, gosh, I didn't intend to hit anybody driving like that, or I didn't intend to be careless, but you did it in such a reckless way that it, it raises to that level. It's an interesting tactical thing. I was a prosecutor, like as you know, Paul, for 26 years before I, I went to the dark side here, yeah. um, that uh, there's a real question about how they uh, – you know, move forward on the strategy wise, because they could have come out of the shoot at the very beginning. They could have amended this complaint in the last two years and had all those counts in there. I think what their thought is, let's wait to see how the evidence comes out. This isn't a bad decision. It's just there's no right or wrong here. It's just how you choose to do it. Say, so let's wait to see how the evidence comes in. Then we'll pick what other charges we want to add. Defense attorneys usually push back real hard about charges being added during trial. Because the argument we make to a judge is, judge, this isn't fair. I was told I had to fight against a certain charge. I built my case on that. I asked certain questions related only to that charge. I only called certain witnesses related to that charge or, or cross-examined people on that issue that way. And now I'm being told there, there are uh, new charges being added that are different or have different elements. So that's not fair to me after, you know, half the cases. Um, but I think the response from a, a, the judge would be, as is here, you know that can happen. You have to plan for that. It's really just a one-off. It's not some totally unrelated offense like drug dealing or something. So therefore, we're going to let them add those charges. But I thought the defense did a nice job in the closing of arguing the state doesn't even know what they've got. They keep just throwing more, more against the wall up to the last minute, hoping you buy one of these charges. And let me take a look at the next screen, uh, Ryan, with the uh, charges against those who survived their stab wounds. Again, there were some lesser included uh, thrown in with these uh, yesterday. This, again, this is the attempted first degree intentional homicide. The, the, those who were stabbed, A.J. Martin, Riley Madison, and then the Carlson brothers, and the, obviously uh, on down your screen, second degree attempted homicide, and then the recklessly endangering safety. Again, this is versus all four of the uh, those who survived their stab wounds. In these types of counts, Marsh, does the, the, the severity of injury matter? Is that important in terms of, well, if he barely touches, you know, one of the young men, Tony and, and Dante, and the injury is minimal, did he really attempt to kill them? Uh, your thoughts on, on sort of injury versus charge? Right, and that was the defense's theory to push back on that, is that they said, look, if this guy really wanted to kill these people, he would have stabbed them more than once. Or, or, you know, one person had a couple stitches, one person had a hernia. When, come on, this is not that level. That he really, he's, he, I think as I recall the defense, the way they put it is he's sitting there with his own group on a kind of like a, a, a you know, friendly outing with others that day. It's not like he says, hey, I think I'm going to go over and go kill somebody. You know, that they did a pretty good job of trying to show that that really wasn't the case. It's a good strategy though by the state in that I, you know, my lecture on this stuff is from the prosecution standpoint, I always say prosecution is like bird hunting. When you go out, you throw a bunch of buckshot up in the air and you want one of the pellets to bring down the bird. You don't care which pellet does it, but you want one of them to do that. And the more chances or the more pellets, the more charges that the jury has to consider, the more likely they might say, well, I don't like all most of these, but at least this one I'm willing to convict on. So the more they throw up, sometimes that can help in that it, it gives each side something. Uh, we caution jurors to not try to be King Solomon here, right? Split the baby half each way, both sides get something. Sometimes jurors think, oh gosh, and the judge even complimented little, all the lawyers at the end for what a great job they all did in their decorum and their professionalism. And the jurors, you don't want them going back and going, you know what, gosh, both of these teams of lawyers were really good people, seemed to do a good job. Let's give both some something on both sides. So we'll convict on something, we won't convict on something else. Defense pushes back hard on that. We don't want that. If they prove the case, so be it, convict them. If they didn't, he's not guilty on all counts. We have uh, several sound bites queued up from yesterday just to get your reaction to some of the arguments made during closing arguments. Uh, but on that point of self-defense and all of the charges, there are more than 20 total counts. Do you see this as an all or nothing if the jury unanimously agrees it was the whole entire episode of self-defense 
he's acquitted on all 21 or so counts, correct? Or can, can they find he defended himself against, say, the others, uh, say Isaac Schumann? Uh, you know, maybe the jury believes that Isaac's hands were at his neck and that he could have been choked or drowned in that moment. So the stab of Isaac could be deemed uh, uh, not, not self-defense, but then the others not so. C could you find a, a jury kind of splitting uh, depending on what they see in that video and the frame by frame photos they've watched. And to, to follow up on my last comment, that's exactly what the defense is worried about is that they could just say, look, we're going to split this. What's a reasonable, rational basis to do that on? It's the level of threat that he perceived. One thing, if a, a person has their you know, hands up on your throat, OK, we get that one. Get these other people that are more at a distance or not as hostile to you. That was that was over the top. So that's where they could split it. But I think there is going to be strong consideration. I think uh, Debbie Lang, my law partner yesterday, kind of alluded to this as well, that it, the self-defense carries across all of them. They believe that. And then, again, you got to look at it from Mew's viewpoint, his mindset, where he was thinking, was that rational to think that they could they could uh, find him not guilty on everything? Well, let's go you know, back. I, oh, sorry. I, I'm struck, Paul, too, about when you put up that graphic at the beginning. This is an old jury. Yeah, I mean, I don't know what the rule is in Wisconsin, but Minnesota at age 70, you can you have the right to not even serve if you choose not to. And you've got, what, two people in their 70s, one person in their 90s, yeah. I think a couple people in their 50, or 60s, 50s or 60s. So at least I think seven out of 12 of these jurors are at least 50 years old. Um, and that's kind of a good thing for the defense because they have, in an artful way, kind of criticized the whole group as kind of being smart ass young drunk kids and the old people go you know i'm a boomer i'm sick of these young millennials being smart asses and everything else so the hope by the state is that a couple of 20 and 30 year olds that are in there we're gonna kind of keep it balanced and say hey wait a minute don't be blanket uh doing that I, the state on when they did their second uh closing tried to raise that indignation a little bit how how horrible that was to try to try to paint these people almost as if they deserved it well, let's take this moment and go back to yesterday, the closing arguments. Corey, Tr can never say his name properly, Trophacy, uh, during his closing, talking about uh, those drunk teens. Uh, Marsh, I'll get your uh, feedback on the uh, backside of this. Where's he going to go? So he doesn't have to go anywhere. We don't let people dictate what we do, and the loudest voice in the room doesn't have to win. Madison Cohen doesn't get to make these decisions for people. He doesn't have to leave. The drunk teenagers don't have to leave either. They told you they could have left, but they wanted to see the show. He doesn't have to go and there's nowhere to go. That should be the beginning, middle, and end of that evaluation on retreat. Same analysis, same result on provocation, okay? You have to find that Nick Mew committed an, un an unlawful conduct against Madison Cohen to provoke this attack. He wanted her to get out of his personal space. The bully in the room doesn't get to yell at you and tell you to leave, and then when you don't leave, doesn't get to get in your personal space because you are not leaving. That's not how this works. And there is that reference again to that Madison Cohen, Nikolai Miu interaction. And just interesting, you think about all the circumstances here, the, the Carlson tubers who arrive, of course, four of them end up getting stabbed. Uh, they were sent over, if you remember from the testimony, Quinton Carlson, the dad who's out celebrating his birthday, sends his two sons over uh, to basically play peacemaker, that he, he sees uh, an older man in, in, in some trouble and not quite sure what's going on, but just this idea of, you know, these 20 somethings were basically sent to you know, clean up the, the situation, take care of the situation, and then it devolves from there. I, I'm just curious, Marsha, your thoughts on uh, Tarofasi there, uh, trying to build this as, as a sort of a viral moment for those teens that Jawan Cockfield is shooting the video and, and that it's almost like they're, they're trying to create a video and at the expense of humiliating Nikolai Miu. 
Yeah, I thought I thought that little clip you played was one of the stronger parts of the defense closing. You know, you, you don't a bully doesn't get to scream at you to leave, and when you don't leave, you know that they somehow are still in power at that point. But the, the state states push back on this. Okay, you don't have to leave, but you sure don't have the right to go stab somebody either. So there's somewhere in between, and sometimes we just are the should be the bigger person. You're the grown up. Walk away. These are drunk, stupid kids. Just let them have their moment. Just walk away. And certainly that. The defense is saying he there he didn't have to go and there was nowhere to go. I think the state, if they could have commented right there, would have said he maybe didn't have to go, but there were lots of places to go. There's lots of open water. These people aren't like surrounding him in a tight circle. He could have just left. Well, let's uh, switch gears here, go over to the state side, uh, listen in uh, to, to um, the comments uh, made uh, by District Attorney, St. Croix County District Attorney Carl Anderson during his closings yesterday. He's clearly not feeble, as you see in the video. He runs up on these boys in the water. He leaves behind devastating, devastating injuries. Slices clean through two of Isaac's ribs. He comes out of the whole event essentially uninjured. While defense tries to argue that Nikolai is this feeble old man, they ignore that the only two people actually standing close to Nikolai are these two females that are barely over 100 pounds. If the boys are a threat, why does Nikolai run up on them? And clearly he knows they're not a threat to him. When he ran up on them, grabbed their tubes, standing over them, they did nothing. They didn't kick up at him, they didn't punch at him, they jumped out of their tubes and moved away from him. He knows they're not a threat to him. They're mocking, saying cruel things, but not violent. You saw how awkward it was for Nikolai to try to explain this transition. From zero fear to 10 out of 10 fear, he's got to take out his knife. Try to explain it with what I submit to you is obviously rehearsed testimony about his scales of fear. Nikolai was angry, he wasn't afraid. He's smirking even as he's holding the knife. Why didn't he just walk away? The fence had tried to argue there's rocks unstable, his sandals were bad, didn't stop him from running up to the boys as they're tubing away from him. Why didn't he just hold the knife up? Say, hey, I got a knife, back up. You saw, Owen is the only person who saw the knife and you saw his reaction. So everyone else is moving forward and respond to Nikolai punching Madison. Owen's trying to pull people back. Next you see him, he's off in the distance. This whole thing would have ended if Nikolai just held up the knife. Instead of opening it down by his waist without looking down, because it's human nature, if he would have looked down, people would have looked down. He holds it down by his waist, opens it up, never displays it, or says he has a knife. Nikolai did not act as any reasonable person would in that situation if they were truly in fear of their life or great bodily harm. So, Marsh, a couple of things there. It's Marsh Hallberg, a criminal defense attorney, Hallberg criminal defense, joining us this morning. A couple of things that jumped out at me uh, during that. Uh, the rehearsed testimony, the suggestion that, uh, you know, Nikolai Miu was rehearsed and practiced. And, and, then, and then Carl Anderson there spinning it as, you know, uh, it's not, uh, he wasn't scared. He was, he was angry. He was humiliated. He wasn't scared. He had no right to self-defense in that moment. Uh, uh, your thoughts on, on the tactics used uh, by the prosecutor during his closings? Yeah, again, a good clip by the state there, didn't you think? I thought that was really good. Again, keep it simple, stupid, right? Just, he could have just walked away. He's humiliated. He's angry. We get that. Anybody would be being called those names and taunted by these guys, but just walk away. And to have not brandished the knife, he's brought it up and said, look, back off. If he had done that, who knows if he would have gotten charged at that point, right? So I think, again, it was a very effective way to do it. Now, in fairness, what the defense would say is he told you things that didn't happen. He said there was a smirk. When they asked Mew that question, he said that's not a smirk. Again, that's one, a 124th screenshot clip you have. That's not what it was. And that wasn't the case. Um, he isn't feeble, but he sure as heck had surgery, what, a year, year and a half earlier. So he's not going to rock and roll with a bunch of young, strong, healthy kids. 
Yeah, I'm struck just as this jury has to make a decision here. And again, I would point out we are in jury deliberations. We saw the jury, I mean, not on camera, but they were in the courtroom briefly at 8 o'clock uh, to rewatch the Juwan Cockfield cell phone video of the uh, deadly encounter on the river. But the way the prosecution sort of describes the subtle nature of the knife coming out, and he's got it down, no one sees it, he doesn't, he doesn't brandish it whatsoever, he doesn't warn off, no one else is armed in that moment. You know, just, you know, you, you, again, it's, it's a human moment. Uh, I, I can't put myself in, in Nikolai Miu's uh, f shoes at that point. But what what is the scenario if he takes it out, fully displays it and takes a couple steps back? You know, if he doesn't by by not doing that, does he really open himself up now to those reckless charges? I get you know, perhaps you take intentional off, you know, just in, in those moments and what you see. But the fact that it was so subtle how, how he went about it, and it took three or four stabbings for the others to even realize what was happening. Does that sort of put him on the hot seat on those reckless counts? Absolutely. I think that's why that's the stronger play. If Mew's going down on something here, it's the reckless charges. And that's maybe the, the split they make. We won't do the top of the box charges of the, of the first degree attempted murder. Uh, but we're going to uh, go with the reckless because, you know, you always talk about jurors aren't supposed to consider consequences. They're back there figuring out this is a murder one case. It may not be a death penalty case in Wisconsin. We know that, but they know it's it can be life. So uh, they realize those subtleties. I thought it was really a good touch by the prosecutor when he said that we'd all look down to make sure when we're opening a blade, we don't cut ourselves. And he actually did that. And that would cause other people to then look down. Uh, that that's what I go. Yeah, that's common sense. You're right. People would have then noticed the knife. So again, little those little things help in closing to kind of refresh the jurors' memory of what's going on. Marsh, I know everybody asks me. You know, what do you think? When's the jury coming back? Uh, they have 20 counts to go through. Again, by my loose math, I'd say they put in about three hours yesterday. They have 21 counts. If if you consider all of the the homicide, the reckless, the attempts, uh, all the way down to battery on. Uh, on uh, Madison Cohen at the moment. Is there a sense that just loosely from your trial experience, you know, you, you, well, they obviously had a night to sleep on some of their early work overnight. Uh, could, could, could a verdict come today? Is this one that just is going to take a while to get unanimous uh, consent on, on, on all of the counts? Right, and as we always know, you can always have a hung juror. One juror hung, hangs out and says, I'm not going that way. I'm, go I'm gonna be against all the rest of you and I refuse to uh, changed my mind and you get a hung jury. That's really frustrating for everyone. I try whenever possible. And uh, a lot of times after a jury trial, uh, a judge may ask the jurors to invite them back in or back to their chambers. And sometimes the lawyers get to go back as well in a very kind of uh, relaxed method to talk to the jurors about what they liked to the trial, what they didn't like. Most trial lawyers, we want to know what we can do better. Win or lose, what did you like about what we did? What didn't you like about what we did? And that also allowed us to talk to them sometimes about how they chose to deliberate. Almost always lawyers level, even a friendly uh, you know, uh, bet between the, the lawyers about who's going to be the foreperson, because that could carry the day a lot. So when we're picking our jury in the very beginning, a lot of times we're trying to decide who's going to be the foreperson, because they can drive this case one way or the other. We kind of will take a broad brush on a lot of people and say they're just nice, open-minded people who will go either way. They're not going to be strongly opinionated, or maybe they're not real strong personalities. They're not leader types. So we try to predict who we think might be our, our four person. A lot of times the way the jurors will structure this, they go back in, they have a mountain of evidence, and they can do it any way they want. They don't have to do any of this. But my experience over 40 some years has been the jurors will go back, they might even make a list on a, on a whiteboard about what do we have here, list of photographs, list of documents, list of recordings, they make a whole list of that. They might make a list of the key elements, the jury instructions, the jigs, about what are the key things we have, that have to be proved here and they'll put those up on the board and they can go around and do that. They're, as you know, they're encouraged not to make a quick decision. Don't take a vote in the first five minutes and uh, uh, you know, walk back in. So that can just take time. Between all of that and you wanna give every person the right to say what they wanna say and argue back and forth. And sometimes it comes down to a, a spokesperson for both kind of sides of a issue or a conviction or not conviction. And you'll have a voice on two sides. So it might not be, five against seven, it might be one-on-one, -on -one, arguing, arguing, and everybody else is just listening. 
I'm just curious. I, I know I do it on the, on the rare trial. I mean, it has to be the highest of profile that I sit in for the, the jury selection process. But we sit in there and uh, try to guess who the, the, the potential jury four person is. How often are you right? I, actually, not that maybe better, better be lucky than good, maybe. But <laughs> a fair amount of times. And sometimes it's, it's oh, crap. It is the one I thought it was going to be, and now we're in trouble. So I've, I, I jokingly say, and this is true, I have won trials in five minutes and I have lost trials in five minutes. They haven't even had time to go back and go to the bathroom. I mean, they, they're back that quick. So um, sometimes they, no matter what you do in the courtroom, they've made up their mind. There are some studies that say jurors in the first few minutes of a trial really have kind of made up their mind that you have to move them away from that. So that first impression is real important. That well, first, it, that opening uh, statement is real important. Yeah, just, just based on community reaction, newsroom reaction, peer group reaction, this case seems to divide everybody on, you know, where self-defense might begin, the, the boys' role in, 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 you know, ratcheting up the situation. I, I, I don't know how you put 12 people in a room and get unanimous uh, on any one topic related to this case, but that's what, what this jury is, uh, is tasked with doing. I just, I, I, again, I've, I've been using, uh, we're, we're running some polls on our live stream, and you know, we've got thousands of viewers out there. We've got 5,000 plus votes already, our team asking. Uh, do you, when do you think the verdict will come in, right, Marsh? This is not scientific by any stretch, but uh, over 5,000 votes of those of you watching on our stream, and we appreciate you out there. 25% anticipating something this morning, so a quarter of our viewers expect something this morning. 45 percent, so nearly half this afternoon, uh, with about a quarter, 22 percent saying Friday, and then another 8 percent don't think we'll hear from them uh, until next week. Um, the jury four person would have been selected by this point. Um, you mentioned, uh, you know, uh, how, how they could go through it. I mean, they had 30 pages. I have the jury instructions. I've just been reading uh, myself just to get myself uh, more familiar with it. 21 counts. Uh, in total. Uh, so as you said, Mark, just a mountain of work to do. Yeah, they're, uh, I'll, I'll go with your, what, 45%. I'm going this afternoon. They want to take their time, have a lunch, take a break, come back, go, anybody change their mind? We're ready to do what we want to do. We do, And then they'll, so I'm thinking this afternoon. And, and the only other tea leaves we have, I want to point out, there's no sourcing. I know I'm you know, a strong reporter, and I, I have sources, but in that room, it's just the 12, and it's the deputy blocking their door. There's no, there's no outside of when they come into the courtroom to ask a question, and we try to glean what that means. There's no, there's no forecasting what is happening. No, it's it's an art, not a science, right? And talk to me, Marsh. I know I, I, you're kind of a historian as it relates to the legal system, just the beauty of our system here. I asked you about it uh, on Monday when you were with us. But this is what, what, it's, what it comes down to. This is, it's not a perfect system, but someone was killed on the river that day. Two people badly injured, a couple others hurt. Um, and now a, ju a jury of 12 peers in St. Croix County, Wisconsin, will have the ultimate say on, on, on what happened. And w was it criminal or was it a justified use of that knife? Right. I think they said part of the reason this has sucked everybody in that they're so interested. There's such a big following. And thank you just as a member of the public for you streaming this. I think it's just a great service. People have this option to see it. But, uh, you know, I, I talked to jurors about when we, we always are so appreciative of our veterans and our people in the service and Fourth of July and all those things. And we, we think about some of those fundamental rights of, of free speech or right of assembly and whatever other rights that you like to think about. Few people ever think about one of the things that our service people have died for is the right to have a jury trial, right? That you have the right to a presumption of innocence in a criminal case, and this is not common across the world. Okay, we we tend to, to assume what we do is what a lot of the else of the world does, and they don't. And we still have a lot of places where an authoritarian uh, person can uh, dictate what's going to happen to someone. So. It, this system's got a lot of flaws. I, I in no way think that we can't do better. But uh, for what we've done with a bunch of you know imperfect human beings, this is a pretty amazing system we've developed. And perhaps, Marsh, uh, you can help lead the way in uh, opening up Minnesota courts a little more to uh, cameras yeah. at, at trial proceedings, because uh, I think it's uh, instructive. Uh, and I certainly, Michael Waterman is running a tight ship. Uh, he trusts the jurors. He's sending them home at night. It's not a sequestered uh, jury. Um, it seems to have gone gone off flawlessly. I mean, we'll see what comes out of it on the back end. but. Um, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm not. I, I certainly have a, a bias here, but uh, it certainly seems to run just fine in Wisconsin. I think 
this is the case you guys should point to when you're trying to make that argument or somebody's trying to lobby to make changes. This, this trial was not affected, I thought, by the courtroom uh, camera. It was very discreetly done. The jurors weren't uh, shown. Um, there are, unfortunately, you know, trial lawyers, we have ego, we have head egos that we can't even fit inside the room, right? <laughs> so the concern is that we're going to start trying cases to the camera versus trying cases to the jury. I thought it was interesting, Paul, you and I chatted on Monday. I talked about another trial strategy that I always like to have my clients do is generally the court will give each side of the courtroom half of the uh, spectator section. And through the trial, from what I could tell when your camera people were scanning the, the jury, uh, excuse me, the uh, spectator box, that the victim side was filled and there were only a few people on the uh, defendant side. But you'll notice when the closings happened that that defense side was also filled. So that's that subtle, again, a lot of those indirect cues you're trying to drive to a jury that this is a man respected in the community, has a lot of friends, he's a good guy. And we so can, whether whatever side you wanna kind of take in this, we're sucked in because you can see yourself being yourself or your kids tubing on the Apple River. What's more kind of wholesome Midwestern summer fun, right? So you can really see that could happen to anybody. And the same thing with Mr. Mew. Seems like a great guy, has a great life story about what he is, you know, hardworking immigrant guy that, um, you know, we can, we can identify with him as well. So you can really start to feel the personal effects this is going to have on both sides. Yeah, and now you mentioned the tubing on the Apple River. This is, uh, you know, obviously local residents of St. Croix County are on that jury. And then uh, Carl Anderson, the DA, said during his closings yesterday, by his recollection when he asked during jury selection, at least half, if not more, raised their hands if they had ever tubed down the Apple River. So it's something familiar to these people. They, they, they would know uh, sort of the circumstances surrounding it and uh, might inform uh, their life experience based on the tragedy that unfolded that day. Marsh, I think it's probably time to uh, take a, a break, reset the case a little bit. And I want to thank you for joining us this morning. I know you'll be on standby if we get a verdict this morning. Um, I understand you have some federal court to business to tend to this afternoon. But um, I'm going to just take one last look inside Judge Waterman's courtroom, if I can, Ryan. This is uh, uh, the state seal we've become uh, familiar with. Uh, over the last uh, couple weeks. Uh, this is the second full day of uh, jury deliberations. There it is uh, to reset for those of you joining us a little late. Uh, the jury uh, came back. We have 12, uh, 12 members of the uh, St. Croix County, um, uh, St. Croix County residents uh, who are sitting in judgment now of Nikolai Miu. Uh, they wanted to rewatch the Juwan Cockfield cell phone video, that three minutes and 20 seconds uh, a video, although they shortened it, they're very specifically interested in the 10 seconds before the physical confrontation between Nikolai Miu and Madison Cohen, the, the blonde girl, if you will, the physical, uh, the, the, what took that altercation, that confrontation uh, from yelling and screaming and taunting uh, to a, a physical um, spark. Uh, they wanted to watch 10 seconds before that straight through the stabbings. They have done that. They have now gone back to their deliberations uh, in private. We have no idea what is going on inside that room. We have no idea the timeline here of when to expect a verdict. They have 21 counts uh, to consider from murder, a first degree intentional homicide that would send uh, Nikolai Mee to prison for life, all the way down to a count of battery, a simple battery uh, for him hurting allegedly Madison Cohen, or at least physically making contact with her. Uh, so from first degree intentional homicide all the way down to battery, uh, the jury has to go through all of this and reach unanimous consent on each and every charge. So with that, we've hit 846 Central Time. Our promise to you throughout has been as soon as there is any activity or movement or public proceedings in this case, we will go inside. But what I want to do now, uh, for those of you who might have missed it in its entirety yesterday, let's go back, take a listen and, and watch the closing arguments uh, beginning first from Carl Anderson, St. Croix County's elected district attorney. Absolutely senseless and horrific acts of violence. And all Nikolai Mew had to do was walk away. All he had to do was walk away. That's what you've seen in this case. You saw he told Lieutenant Hart, they told me I can't run away. Obviously not true. Think about the result of his actions. Everything you've seen in this trial, the horrific injuries, the death of Isaac, why didn't he just walk away? His only explanation when testifying was, I stood my ground. I stood my ground. First of all, Wisconsin is not a stand your ground state. Objection. 
Overruled. I'll talk about that specifically from your jury instructions. Second, that's not true as I'll show you. He didn't just stand his ground. I'm not going to defend the actions of the boys who testified. It was cruel what they were calling Nikolai. They shouldn't have been mocking him, calling him predator, raper. But their conduct did not justify what Nikolai did. You heard from Alina, Isaac's mother, about her son Isaac. He was 17 years old when he was killed. He enjoyed golfing, spending time with friends. He recently started a new business, detailing cars. He was an honor student looking forward to going to college. His death was senseless. One of the things defense said in the beginning of trial in their opening was, they're glad there's a video. So are we. Without the video, Nikolai would have slipped away. The only reason he was apprehended was because law enforcement had that screenshot of him. The video doesn't fade with time. It's not biased, not influenced by alcohol. As I told you in the beginning of this case, the violent episode from the video is about 25 seconds, from the point he punches Madison until you see him walking off after stabbing five people. He's not seen, Nikolai is not seen in that video for eight to nine seconds until the point you see him walking away. You don't see him stab Dante. Some of you may have wondered why we called Larry and Davis. Certainly it wasn't for his eyewitness testimony, but he took a video. He took a video that captured a different angle than Juwan's video. It's grainy, it's difficult to see, but you can see enough. <clears throat> and it shows Nikolai seeking Dante out and stabbing him when his group is in the opposite direction. Nikolai walks into a crowd of people, stabbed on, stabs Dante. Before I show you that video again, I need to provide some context from Juwan's video. Take it off. the screen please so here at two minutes and six seconds this is after Nikolai has stabbed the four people that you do see parts of on the video he's standing next to Ariel Ariel's there Nikolai's not by himself Two minutes, eight seconds, that's the last you'll see of Nikolai until you see him walking off in this video. You see Dante, or AJ, the boys running back to their tubes, and you see Larian filming in the background. Larian captured what, what Nikolai was doing at this point, even though this video didn't. And here, in a moment, you can see the edge of Dante swim trunks on the right. You can see the light on top, the dark on bottom. At this point in Larian's video, Dante's just been stabbed. Next, you see of Nikolai, he's walking off. You can see Dante in the background, holding his stomach, looking down at his wound. Take it down. Oh, actually, you can keep it up for a second, sorry. And then for um, further context, you see Alex Bang running to Isaac. <laughs> I 
Oh, let's see Larian's video. <coughs> Okay, I have a screen. Remember, Nikolai admitted he walked up to Larian. I mean, excuse me, he walked up to Dante and stabbed him. He admitted Dante was the last person he stabbed. Here you can see Nikolai, dark swim trunks, bigger build. On the right, you can see Dante, swim trunks, lighter on top, darker on bottom. You'll see Nikolai walk up to Dante and stab him in the chest. You'll see Dante recoil from the stab. You see the boys on the right running to their tubes. And in the second here, you'll see Alex Vang. He'll zoom in on as he runs to Isaac. I'm going to show that again. So few things to know, there's, no, there's nothing between Nikolai and Larian. He's not surrounded. His friend Ariel is there at this point. There's nothing to the left and behind Nikolai, except his group in the distance that you can't see on video. He walks away from those directions towards a group of people and stabs Dante in the chest, not standing his ground. He's seeking out Dante. That's retribution, not self-defense. Recall to the DNA results, Isaac's DNA and Dante's DNA was the only DNA on the knife. They're also the last two that are stabbed. It makes sense from how the analyst described DNA and how it can wash off. You probably noticed throughout this trial, not a lot of witnesses come off looking great after they testify. There's some exceptions, obviously the Good Samaritans who went to aid Isaac and AJ. Eric Von Williams included in that from Nikolai's group. He's the only one who went to their aid. Sheena Lowell, you heard her testify from the Carlson group. You saw her just standing in the background watching what was going on the whole time. She was completely sober. You heard her testify, Nikolai Punch Madison. She has zero connection with the group anymore, zero contact. Her and Quentin broke up. Tony is another one. He only comes in to break up what he thinks is a fist fight. He's directing. Nikolai, towards Nikolai's group, Nikolai turns and stabs him twice. Another one I submit to you is an exception that acted admirably is Isaac. His death was tragic and horrific. This is what you see of Isaac in the video. On the left, he's standing next to his tube, not moving away from his tube. He's pointing at Nikolai to leave. In the middle, when Nikolai turns back to Isaac, Isaac puts his hands up, fingers played. The only other thing you see of Isaac is him standing in the background. When the boys, other boys are mocking calling names to Nikolai. Isaac is just standing in the background. He's not saying anything. He's not doing anything. He's not jeering. He's just standing there holding their tubes. There's been a pretty serious mischaracterization of Isaac's actions with regard to when he gets stabbed. Defense has tried to clarify it classify it as a strangulation. Defense accused the state in openings of being selective in the photos we used, the frames, to try to show a certain narrative about Nikolai smiling. As you've seen, he's smiling a lot in the video. But defense is actually doing that with when it comes to Isaac. Nikolai never said anything about being choked, never said anything about pain on his neck, even when specifically asked by the start nurse, never mentions anything. And the video doesn't lie. 
So on the left, Nikolai has just stabbed Riley, who you heard from multiple witnesses, are just standing there. Tony comes to try to break it up. Nikolai stabs him twice. Isaac, just off frame, I submit to you, he just saw Nikolai stab those two people completely unprovoked. Although he was in the background the whole time, not doing anything, he came, he came to their aid. And he pushes Nikolai. You can clearly see it's a push. He has one hand on the arm, other hand on the chest. It's Nikolai's own action of thrusting the knife into Isaac's heart that moves Isaac's hands. You can even see from the release, it's a push. He's not sitting there left holding his hands out in a choking motion. Can we take the screen down? Yes. I'm going to show you the video so you can see it's obviously a push. While my computer is loading here, even if it was a strangulation, which it clearly isn't, Isaac was justified in using any level of force. He just saw Nikolai stab two people who posed no threat to Nikolai. Tony was breaking up the fight. He had actually ignored <laughs> Nikolai at first, walked past him, pushed Dante out of the way. Riley was just standing there. Met two minutes and three seconds. Can we have the screen? Clearly a push. Defense has mischaracterized the entire situation as 13 on 1, 13 on 1, implying it's some sort of mob beating up Nikolai. It's not even 13 people yelling at Nikolai. As you saw in the video, Gabby, Janelle, they're just standing in the background. Isaac, he's just standing in the background, not yelling anything. It's 13 people in the proximity, only two close to him, two tiny females. Nikolai's clearly not afraid of the boys. He ran up on the boys, turns his back on them and others multiple times. Even at worst, this is a two-on-one with AJ and Dante. But even then, as you saw in the video, Ariel's right there. So it's more like a two-on-two, -two. Ariel's right there. Plus, Tony comes in as a neutral party to separate things. It's not 13-on-one. As soon as AJ gets disemboweled, you see people start to move away. So it's not, there's not even 13 people immediately around. You saw Owen way in the background, because he saw the knife. So why try to mischaracterize the situation? Because there's some things that are hard to explain otherwise for defense. Can you turn on the screen, please? This is the second time you saw in the video that Nikolai turns his back on the boys and people from the Carlson group. You don't turn your back on somebody. It's common sense. You don't check your common sense at the door when you serve as a jury. You don't turn your back on somebody if you're afraid of them, especially if you're so afraid you've got to reach for your knife. You can't be that afraid that he's got to reach for his knife and so unafraid that he turns his back on them. He was angry, not afraid. That image on the right is only less than 30 seconds after he turns his back on them, touching his knife. The defense tried to explain that change from in that 30 second window by saying he was getting pushed by Madison and Riley. He was getting pushed. They're lightly touching his arms, and they're tiny. 
They're not in his face. You can see in the images, they're standing close. They're not in his face. They're not shaking their fists at him. They're not even sticking their fingers in his face. They're standing close to him, touching his shoulders, pointing, yelling at him to leave. <clears throat> I'm going to back up a little bit and talk about Nikolai looking for the fall. So Eric Von Williams from Nikolai's group, you heard testify, before any of this happened, he was concerned about Nikolai's behavior. He was concerned that people were going to think he was a predator. Ernesto told Nikolai not to go look for the phone. The group, others in the group told him not to. You heard they didn't care about the phone. Ariel didn't care about the phone. Nikolai went. Sandy said he went twice, was back for five to ten minutes, then went again over by the boys. Defense argued in opening that the, the boys' goal, their goal was to humiliate Nikolai. Clearly, he wasn't looking for little girls. But the boys were not completely unreasonable in their belief. Eric Von Williams thought the same thing. They reacted wrong, but they just didn't invent this whole thing in order to humiliate Nikolai. What about Nikolai, 52 years old, apparently sober, according to, I think, what defense will argue. Uh, he didn't have any signs of intoxication when law enforcement made contact with him, but he certainly made a point of telling Lieutenant Hart multiple times how much he was losing and drinking on the river. He can't let it go that he was insulted, so much so that as the boys are tubing away from him, all Nikolai has to do is stand there. He doesn't even have to take a step back. He just has to stand there but the boys continue tubing. They're down in their tubes. He starts walking up to them, touches his knife, and then runs up to them. You heard Nikolai's ridiculous description or explanation for why he ran up on the boys. Because one was holding a phone, he thought it was Ariel's phone. You also heard Nikolai had to concede, had to admit that pretty much everyone on the river had those phone cases. Another double standard from defense is physical attributes of those involved. They wanted to elicit evidence that Nikolai is feeble. Sandy, he wasn't feeble according to Sandy. He had a surgery a couple years ago, recovered in a few weeks. Maybe things took him a little long, longer than they did before. He wasn't feeble according to Ernesto. You heard Ernesto, when he was being asked about the stabbing, said, He's a big guy, he was in the army, he doesn't need a knife to defend himself. He didn't say, oh, he's this fragile old guy. He's clearly not feeble as you see in the video. He runs up on these boys in the water. He leaves behind devastating, devastating injuries. Slices clean through two of Isaac's ribs. He comes out of the whole event essentially uninjured. While defense tries to argue that Nikolai is this feeble old man, they ignore that the only two people actually standing close to Nikolai are these two females that are barely over 100 pounds. If the boys are a threat, why does Nikolai run up on them? And clearly he knows they're not a threat to him. When he ran up on them, grabbed their tubes, standing over them, they did nothing. They didn't kick up at him, they didn't punch at him, they jumped out of their tubes and moved away from him. He knows they're not a threat to him. They're mocking, saying cruel things, but not violent. You saw how awkward it was for Nikolai to try to explain this transition from zero fear to 10 out of 10 fear, he's got to take out his knife. Try to explain it with what I submit to you is obviously rehearsed testimony about his scales of fear. You heard from witnesses recounting what they recall of Nikolai, the demonic look on his face, looking, staring through people, smirking. Defense argued an opening, it's a slide tour here, there. 
You know after seeing the video so many times that's not the case. When he's not glaring, he's smirking in the video. Recall I asked Ernesto, his best friend, when he was trying to describe the shock of Nikolai, I asked, was he smiling? He didn't say, yeah, he smiles when he's scared. He smiles when he's nervous. He said, who's going to smile in a situation where they're in shock or in fear? Nikolai was angry. He wasn't afraid. He's smirking even as he's holding the knife. Why didn't he just walk away? The fence had tried to argue there's rocks in the stable, his sandals were bad, didn't stop him from running up to the boys as they're tooling away from him. Why didn't he just hold the knife up? Say, hey, I got a knife, back up. You saw, Owen is the only person who saw the knife and you saw his reaction. So everyone else is moving forward and respond to Nikolai punching Madison. Owen's trying to pull people back. Next you see him, he's off in the distance. This whole thing would have ended if Nikolai just held up the knife. Instead of opening it down by his waist without looking down, because it's human nature, if he would have looked down, people would have looked down. He holds it down by his waist, opens it up, never displays it, or says he has a knife. Nikolai did not act as any reasonable person would in that situation if they were truly in fear of their life or great bodily harm. So let's talk. Here's, here's Owen reacting, as you see. Again, Isaac just standing in the background in the middle. You see when other people are moving forward, Owen's trying to pull them back. You heard him yell, bro, he's got a knife. So let's talk about the punch to Madison. I submit to you the evidence shows clearly, beyond a reasonable doubt, Nikolai punched her. She fell backwards, but caught herself. Multiple witnesses testified to seeing her falling backwards. Defense is saying, arguing or on cross. Well, she's not wet. She didn't actually fall down. If witnesses are all standing in that kind of semicircle around Nikolai, she gets punched and falls backwards, and then their attention's back to Nikolai, because Dante's hitting him. They're not going to see that she caught herself. They're going to think she fell down. Look at her position next to Riley. The shoulder to shoulder in front of Nikolai before the camera pans away. When the camera pans back, now Dante's shoulder to shoulder with Riley, and Maddie is back. She clearly got knocked backwards. Her sunglasses aren't on her head anymore. Defense has a double standard about that, too. If there's not a photo of it, it didn't happen. If there's not a photo of an injury, it didn't happen. We know Nikolai got punched. He didn't have any injury. Defense can't have it both ways. So I'll turn and talk a little bit about memory, credibility. Obviously, a witness's memory is better closer to the event. That's obvious. Alcohol is going to affect memory. Traumatic events are going to affect memory. How fast it happens is going to affect memory. But crucially, and absolutely crucially, there's a huge difference between getting some details wrong, right hand, left hand, sequence of events, and making up an entire story like Nikolai did. Defense has tried to art highlight throughout the trial. Nikolai was in this traumatic experience. Give him a break. It's understandable. He made up this huge, all these lies, told this whole story. Even though he looks calm and collected in the videos, he's convincing in the videos, talking to the sheriff, talking to Lieutenant Hart. But don't give any sort of credence to the theory that trauma affects memory for the, anyone in the Carlson's group, any of the boys, any who were stabbed, any who had to drag Isaac as he's bleeding to death to the shore, AJ who was disemboweled. Don't give any credence that trauma might affect their memory and how accurately they can remember all the details. But Nikolai, who invented an entire story, tried to skip through the crowd 
give him credence for that. You saw what happened to all these witnesses, how fast it happened. It's not surprising, some of the details are wrong. But the major point is, is accurate, is consistent. This all started when Nikolai punched Madison, whether it was the right hand or left hand. You heard the turmoil of the boys when they realized Isaac is stabbed. Clearly a traumatic experience. There's a big difference between details and invention. Think about the most basic example. You and, say, your partner go to the grocery store. Park your car, you're leaving the grocery store, you think your car's parked over there, they think it's parked over here. You still know the car is parked in the parking lot, even if you can't remember where it's parked. The same is true for the punch to Madison. You heard from 10 people, from both from the Carlson group and the Boyd's group, that Nikolai struck Madison. So what about, let's talk a little bit about witnesses from Nikolai's group, Ariel, what did he say? At trial, he says, Nick defended himself. Can't really say how. <laughs> Never said that when interviewed with law enforcement. He denied even being close to Nikolai. Remember, Ariel was there when he stabbed Dante. He was right there when Nikolai stabbed Riley, Tony, and Isaac. Law enforcement went there with the frame of Ariel standing next to Nikolai when Nikolai has the bloody knife. Ariel denies seeing anything to law enforcement of what Nikolai did. Ernesto, at trial, testified he didn't see Nikolai get hit, just saw him down in the water. Said he couldn't remember Nikolai saying, they took my knife. You saw on the body cam, he said that repeatedly. He testified that somebody was walking towards him, he pointed at him, get back. Never said that to law enforcement, although he did describe to law enforcement, as you saw, him saying, Nikolai, get out, Nikolai walking out, and then he said, and that's it. Never said anything about anyone pointing at him and walking towards him. When I asked, he said, I wasn't asked that question, but he described that event. He also wasn't asked more than 10 times if Nikolai said they took my knife. So... About the punch to Madison again. Sergio, he's in Nikolai's group. He had walked out a little ways. You can see him in the photo on the left, in the top right. He had the white shirt, white bucket hat. He testified he saw the blonde girl in the black leotard walk over to Nikolai and say, go, go, go. He said it repeatedly to law enforcement. And he said Nikolai pushed her. So this is what it would have looked like from his perspective, although a lot farther back in that photo on the right. How could he have seen Nikolai do anything to Madison unless she got pushed back, punched back, something violent, not some light push? He's not going to see that from where he was. Madison testified, and you saw in the video, after she was hit, she goes back to her group. Why would she walk away back to her group if Nikolai just lightly maybe touched her, maybe didn't? She told Quentin she was punched. She told police at the scene she was punched. She told police in the interview she was punched. She testified about feeling the throbbing pain in her cheek, her heartbeat in her cheek. Maddie testified, she was told by law enforcement, Sheriff's Office, they didn't need the photo. You heard about that misunderstanding. She was, had anxiety about deleting the photo. In an effort to console her, she was told, don't worry about it. This is an important jury instruction in your jury instructions. 
although we're not a stand your ground state, there's also not a duty to retreat. But in determining whether Nikolai's actions, whether his use of force was reasonable to prevent or terminate the interference, you may consider whether he had the opportunity to retreat with safety, whether such retreat was feasible, and whether he knew of the opportunity. He turned his back on them multiple times facing open water. People were yelling at him to leave, to walk away, to go. And he didn't. Instead, he took out his knife. That is not reasonable. You heard from Sheena Lowell, Janelle Duxbury, Gazi Khazri and Nazimpour, Dante Carlson and AJ about the strike to Madison. You heard from the boys, Ryan Nelson, Juan Cockfield, Landon Wire, and Alex Bain. Alex Bain originally described in this lab. You heard from Owen that he heard an impact and saw Madison fall back and catch herself. Defense has to argue that they're all either lying or mistaken. All these witnesses, including Sergio. If they're lying, why, wouldn't Quint why would Quinton say, I saw some, some swelling and some slight redness, but didn't see the punch? Why wouldn't he just say, yeah, I saw the punch, too? Why wouldn't Tony say he saw the punch? Why wouldn't Tony say he saw Riley get stabbed and she's just standing there? They're, they tried to explain what happened as best they could remember. The punch isn't on video, but you see the reaction. You hear Dante yell, you can't hit a woman before Riley is stabbed. They obviously didn't plan this lie in the chaos of the moment, so the only thing defense can argue is they're mistaken. That all of these people standing around Nikolai in that half circle, proximate shape, they're all looking in that direction, including Sergio, including Sheena, who was by the, group, the, the tubes for the Carlson group. They all were wrong in what they saw. Another defense double standard, it's relatively minor, but I submit to you it shows that they're grasping at straws, is this trying to put Nikolai's group in a different category. There's the drunks on the Apple River, then there's Nikolai's group. About half of you raised your hand that you've been on the Apple River. That's what people do on the Apple River. They go up, they tube, and they drink. Nikolai was in the exact same boat they were in. He, he wasn't bird watching and this group of drunk teenagers ran up on him. He knew what it's about. He'd been on the river before. Another thing about the punch to Madison, you heard that they didn't get to see the video before giving their statements. Even Jawan, who took the video, said he got, his, he got far enough to get the screenshot of Nikolai, and then law enforcement took his phone. He didn't get to see the video. You saw what happens in this case if somebody lies about something that happened on video, because Nikolai got burned by that. He made up in complete and total lies. The video showed he wasn't telling the truth. The video happens to not show the punch, but it still corroborates what all those witnesses said. So count six is battery to Madison Cohen. It has four elements. Nikolai caused the battery to Maddie, or caused the injury, the harm, the pain. She testified to that. He intended to cause the harm despite his denial. I submit to you that's clear. You don't punch somebody without intending to cause harm. She didn't consent. She testified to that. He knew she didn't consent. She's a stranger. Obviously, she didn't consent. He knew that. Punching Madison was not self-defense. Again, there's no duty to retreat, but you have to consider the opportunity to retreat, the knowledge of the opportunity to retreat, and whether the use of force was necessary in preventing the unlawful or the interference in, Mr. in Nikolai's um, person. So what is the interference at the time he punches Madison? The boys are saying cruel things to him. Maddie and Riley are standing in, in front of him, lightly touching his shoulders. People are pointing and laughing, the boys. They're not 
Matt and Riley aren't in his face. They're standing close, but they're not in his face. What amount of force was necessary to prevent that interference? People yelling at him, Matt and Riley standing close. What amount of force was necessary? Absolutely zero. Just walk away. That's what people are yelling at him to do, just walk away. Instead, he takes out his knife and punches Madison. Regardless of whether you, you were convinced beyond a reasonable doubt it was a punch, Nikolai essentially admit, admitted to pushing her. Your Sergio said it was a push, although when asked, he couldn't remember if it was a push or a punch. There's still provocation. Your jury instructs him to talk about provocation. And how that affects self-defense. Person may not use or threatened force intended or likely to cause death unless he or she reasonably believes he or she has exhausted every other reasonable means to escape or otherwise avoid death or great bodily harm. Remember, Nikolai ran up on these boys who were too annoying. They didn't run up on him. He ran up on them as they're tubing away from him because they insulted him. He was angry. He didn't walk away from the boys to leave the situation. He went over to Maddie, who was yelling at him to leave, and he lies to her and says, they took my snorkel. I'm going to play that for you so you can hear it. This is at 105 in the video, I'm ready. Go! 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 had accused the boys of taking a snorkel, which was a lie. And he had just ran up on the boys. So, after he runs up on the boys as they're tubing away, he goes and tells Maddie they took my snorkel. He's standing there, smirking at people, takes out his knife, either punches or pushes Maddie. That's provocation. Defense has zero reasonable argument, especially when it comes to Tony, Riley, Isaac, and Dante. Nikolai gets punched. He gets struck with an open hand twice. He gets ineffectually pushed by AJ. It doesn't do anything. Nikolai pops right up and disembowels AJ. After Nikolai goes down in the water, nobody approaches him. Nobody. Nobody goes to kick him. Nobody goes to punch him. Nobody goes to push him again. Tony, with Nikolai down on the ground, Tony walks by Nikolai with his back to Nikolai, yelling, get back to Dante. He turns around to tell Nikolai to get away and Nikolai turns around and stabs him. Nikolai was facing his group with an open path of escape after provoking a reaction. He just stabbed Riley before stabbing Tony. After stabbing those two, he stabs Isaac. After that, after Ariel's there, he walks over to Dante, stabs Dante in the chest, right below his ribs, right below his heart. So self-defense, I submit to you, the state has proven beyond a reasonable doubt this was not justified self-defense, and Nikolai knew it. He knew it from the moment he did it. First of all, imminent threat of death or great bodily harm. He's not in an alley with no way out, with people blocking his exit. He's on an open river, 150 feet wide, people yelling at him to get away. 
or none of them are armed, punch, two open hand strikes, ineffectual push. Look at, your def look at the definition of great bodily harm, whether he reasonably believes death or great bodily harm is imminent. <coughs> Former attempted first degree homicide for Dante, AJ, Tony, and Riley. The state has to prove that he intended to kill each of them. And the acts demonstrate unequivocally, under all circumstances, that he had formed the intent and would have caused the death of each of them, except for the intervention of some other person and an extraneous factor. Third, the defendant did not actually believe that the force used was necessary to prevent death, human death, or great bodily harm. So, for the intent to kill, but for outside circumstances. AJ, it's beyond clear. He would have died, but for the blood in the helicopter. He would have died, but not for the surgery Dr. Meyer performed. He is lucky, extremely lucky to be alive. What, what else was Nikolai's intent but to kill when he slices him up like that? He had the knife blade up. That wasn't an accident. He did not know. He, the first thing he does with it is slice up AJ's stomach. Riley, he slashes across the ribs. You saw the horrific nature of those wounds. He cut into her stomach, cut into her diaphragm. Luckily, he didn't hit any major arteries or her heart or lung. Tony blocked one stab, so Nikolai stabbed him again. The one he blocked, you saw in the injury, was very close to where AJ's uh, artery was severed. Dante was stabbed again, just below his heart. But for Nikolai missing vital organs, but for medical intervention, Mew claimed he had tunnel vision. Oh, sorry, back up. So Dr. Meyer also testified you heard about any time there's a puncture, stab, puncture wound to the torso and the stomach, they have to go in because there's so many major veins, arteries, organs, they have to go in to make sure something major isn't done. Nikolai killed Isaac, almost killed AJ. Riley needed emergency surgery, luckily, but for dumb luck, he missed the vital organs of Dante. But for AJ blocking one strike and missing vital organs, he survived. Nikolai said he had tunnel vision. Come the screen. I thought everyone close to me was attacking me. I thought anyone touched me was attacking me. He didn't stab Ariel, and Ariel came up. It makes the tunnel vision claim a little bit unconvincing. For first degree intentional homicide of Isaac Schumann, Nikolai stabbed him so hard he cut clean through two ribs. The wound was deeper than it was wide. He sliced Isaac's heart. There's no other intent when you stab somebody directly in the heart than to kill. An intent to kill doesn't need to be planned ahead of time. Your jury instructions talk about that. It doesn't have to be formed a week, a month, a day, even a minute in advance. As long as he had that intent when he does the act, that's intentional homicide. The first element is he caused Isaac's death. That's obvious. Acted with intent to kill. I've addressed that. Did not actually believe the force was necessary to prevent imminent death or great bodily harm. I'm going to get to that in a little bit for all the counts. Third element, he did not reasonably believe the force was necessary. That also goes to, I'm oh, sorry, that's part of the third element. So how do we know, how do you know, how can, what Nikolai believe? What a reasonable person would believe? That there's only one person on the planet who experienced what Nikolai experienced, saw what he saw, was standing in his place. And what did Nikolai believe? He believed it was unjustified. The very first thing he does is walk away, doesn't run, doesn't tell Ariel or Ernesto anything, doesn't tell them to run. He walks away from his group to the other side of the river, at some point rinses the knife because it wasn't covered in blood, <laughs> throws the knife onto the bank before walking back to his group, 
says nothing to his group other than they took my knife, puts on his hat, sunglasses, and shirt, and sits down in his tomb. He's the one, as he said in his interview, who says, let's go, let's get out of here. They can't right away because Eric isn't there. You saw, and as they're tubing down the river, you saw the video of him casually paddling along. You saw, so plan one, get away. Slink away with the crowd. That didn't work. Plan two, play down. Can you take the screen down, please? Camera recording started. Still doing all right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. What's going Temperature? On? Temperature's okay in here? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Somebody, uh, I hear somebody got stabbed. Uh, and I fit the description. Yes, you do. All right. Yep. So we're working what? through that now. Okay. Did you see that fight on the river? I heard about it. You heard about it? Yeah, and I've seen people gather around it. Okay. All right. And I went over to talk to see if somebody saw anything, but that's about it. Okay. Our whole group was pretty interested in finding out what happened. Okay. And that's your whole group over there? Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. So I don't know. Okay, well. Did you see anybody injured? No. You didn't see anybody injured? No. Did you see anybody fighting? I, I heard people screaming at each other, yes. Okay. Yeah. Screaming in anger or screaming in pain, do you know? Everybody's drunk, so I don't know. I can't tell the difference, but I would say... I don't know. Just screaming. Okay. You know, yeah, calling each other names. But, you know, that's, I've seen that all day. And we've all been drinking a lot. I'm sure they're drunk. I'm sure they're doing... I don't know. Okay. Kids right. being kids. Kids being kids. Uh, where where are you? Where's your group from? Where did you drive from today? Sure, they're drunk. Kids being kids. That's what he told Sheriff Hughes, and he's acting like he has no idea what's going on. Clearly not in shock. Let me take it down. Sorry. <clears throat> Clearly not in shock. Clearly Nikolai knows that was not justified and he's looking out for Nikolai. Slinking away didn't work. Plain dumb didn't work. He's told he's under arrest for homicide. Plan three. Completely lie about what happened as to justify him using lethal force. The boys pulled out the knives. They twisted their arm, poked them. That's what he used, poke, with, his own, with their own knife. So first degree intentional homicide and second degree intentional homicide are very similar. The, for first degree, it's did, act, did Nikolai actually believe, did he actually believe that he was not justified? For second degree, it's the reasonable person standard. I submit to you, it doesn't make a difference in this case. It's crystal clear. He knew he wasn't justified. He knew he wasn't justified. It's crystal clear from his actions after the fact. Can't be explained away by shock. He's clearly not in shock. The use of force on AJ, stabbing Riley just standing there, stabbing Tony trying to break it up, stabbing Isaac directly in the heart. Ariel's there walking up to Dante and stabbing him. The injuries he left behind, that all shows his intent. Again, you have to consider whether he knew he could retreat, whether there was a safe escape. He could have just walked away. He could have just raised his knife. He didn't do any of that. He just stood there with the knife until he punched Madison. He touched his knife when running up on the before running up on the boys. He takes out the knife, opens the blade up, 
Never says anything, never walks away, never takes a step back, never raises the knife, never yells for help. He's smirking with the knife in his hand. Originally, I mean, finally, after stabbing five people, then he walks away. Doesn't run, walks. It's shocking to see what Nikolai did in this case, to see the injuries, and then see his calm, cool demeanor after the fact, tubing down the river, sitting in his tube at the scene with chaos, casually talking to Sheriff Knudsen, making up this huge lie to Lieutenant Hart. He even lied to the start nurse at 9 p.m., so five hours after the incident, about the boy pulling a knife, twisting his arm, poking him with his own knife. He even lied to Sandy after the arrest. Nick recognizes that his, what happened, is not justified self-defense. Just standing there with the knife, not walking away when he clearly can. So even to Sandy, after he's charged, he casts blame on her and the group for not hearing him yelling. For not hearing him yelling. He never yelled. Normally it'd be difficult to know what a defendant believed in a self-defense case, not in this case. Nikolai was not in fear, he snapped. He was angry and he snapped. And he knew it. His actions show he knew he did not reasonably believe the amount of force was necessary. He was not actually in fear. If he was actually in fear, he would have left. How else do you know what other clues? Think about his testimony. We submit to you that this is first degree intentional homicide and first degree attempted homicide. His acts clearly show intent. But if you can't agree unanimously on that, as your jury instructions tell you, you have to consider second degree. Again, the difference in second degree is Nikolai's belief versus reasonable person. Here you know, I submit to you, his belief from his own conduct. Afterwards, he knew it was not justified. If you can't agree on second degree, you consider first degree reckless homicide, first degree reckless in danger of safety. Element one, Nikolai endangered the safety of another human being. That's obvious. Endangered the safety of another by criminally reckless conduct. The jury instructions def define criminally reckless conduct, creating a risk of death or great bodily harm. It's unreasonable and substantial. He was aware of the risk. Again, obvious when he's stabbing people. When you talk about reckless conduct, let's say you believe his testimony that he just thought anyone touching him, anyone close to him was attacking him and stabbing him. That's reckless. That's criminally reckless conduct. That's utter disregard for human life. What other clues are there out there to disregard? He just walks away. He just walks away. He doesn't call 911. He just sits on his tube as other people are helping the victims. And he tubes down the river. The last. Your jury instructions talk about the last, the question, the special question, yes or no, did he commit these crimes while possessing a dangerous weapon, the pocket knife? There's nothing inherently wrong with carrying a pocket knife. A lot of people carry pocket knives. <coughs> totally fine to carry it as a tool. Totally fine to carry it in, for self-defense. Totally fine to carry any legal weapon, firearm, knife, if it's used legally. Nikolai did not use, he was not justified in self-defense when he attacked these people. So we'd ask that you answer yes on that question. In the end, what is beyond clear, Nikolai knew, he knew this was not self-defense. All of his actions, from the minute the stabbings are done, from the second the stabbings are done, he knew it. It's obvious. His actions were horrific, they were senseless. He killed Isaac Schumann, stabbed him directly in the heart. 
disemboweled AJ. Step Tony is trying to break up a fight. Riley, who's just standing there, and then walks up to Dante. <coughs> that walking up to Dante, stabbing him when he's got clear passive retreat, that destroys any argument that this was self-defense. He was angry. There's no rational reason Nikolai, his groups over here, would walk this way towards the group of people to stab Dante. Senseless and horrific acts. The state asks that you find Nikolai and you guilty of all charges. Thank you. And good morning again from our Fox 9 streaming center. You, of course, are continuing to watch our live stream coverage of the Apple River stabbing trial from Hudson, Wisconsin. Uh, we just listened into yesterday's closing arguments from St. Croix County District Attorney Carl Anderson. On the other side of your screen is a live look at the courtroom. We'll keep that shot up for you. Uh, that just uh, is letting you know nothing is happening inside the courtroom. So much, though, happening in a nearby jury room. The jury now deliberating the case. I can call up uh, the jury makeup uh, to remind uh, viewers of this now six male, six female jury. Two male alternates in their 40s and 60s sent home. They are on standby. They can come back in and deliberate should anything happen. Uh, to the primary 12 jurors who are deciding Nikolai Miu's fate. Uh, as we've talked about this morning, seven are at least Nikolai Miu appear, you know, in terms of age, uh, three in their 50s, uh, three more in their 70s, one 90s uh, in terms of an age demographic here. So seven uh, skew uh, more in the age realm of, 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 of the defendant, Nikolai Miu and then five uh, in their 20s, uh, 30s, and 40s. Uh, the only comments or uh, any indication at all of news from this jury, uh, we've heard from them twice since they got this case, uh, not quite 24 hours ago. Uh, they received it at 1227 on Wednesday. Uh, they did come back into the court about 90 minutes after getting the case. They wanted to watch the Jawan Cockfield videos. Remember, Jawan Cockfield shot two videos, one a nine or 10 second uh, quick uh, video clip, if you will. The initial encounter with Nikolai Mew, and then, of course, the three minutes and 20 seconds capturing uh, the, the brunt, uh, the, the most of, uh, if not all, of the uh, deadly confrontation. Uh, so they watched each of those videos twice. They went back to deliberating. Uh, they went home. Uh, they adjourned for the day at 4.30 yesterday afternoon, but then came right back this morning, 8 a.m., and rewatched the primary Juwan Cockfield video uh, once again in the presence of the judge and the parties. And I would just point out, the second time they came back into court, they specifically wanted to see the video 10 seconds before the encounter between Nikolai Miu, the defendant, and Madison Cohen, the blonde girl, that physical spark that took this confrontation from a four temperature wise up to a 10. What happened in those 10 seconds before uh, Miu and Madison Cohen, who touched who, who was in whose space, uh, who did right, who did wrong, what did Miu do? Uh, they wanted to watch those 10 seconds straight through uh, the end of the stabbing. So with that, we're at 945 Central Time. Uh, we continue to watch uh, the courtroom. We also, I want to remind viewers, we have a, 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 a Fox 9 News a crew uh, at the courthouse. So should anything happen in short order, we are covered on the ground. And obviously this live stream camera will be up. And just as soon as any news, anything public, uh, any proceeding, uh, any verdict that whatsoever is reached, uh, we'll come right back to our live, live coverage. But for now, uh, we heard from the state there. Let's go in. We'll listen to the defense closing arguments from yesterday, followed by the state's 15-minute rebuttal from Assistant District Attorney Brian Smeestad. So, ladies and gentlemen, in his opening statement, uh, Attorney Nelson said to you, one of the things you're going to have to determine is what happened on July 30th, 2022. Well, <laughs> What happened on July 30th, 2022, is a group of drunk teenagers led by the ringleader, Juwan Cockfield, 
saw an opportunity to torment a man who was by himself. They taunted him. They called him names like raper and pedophile and predator. They did this for no legitimate purpose. When they did this, their yelling and carrying on, it attracted the attention of another group, right? Led by Madison Cohen and Dante Carlson. Six drunk teenagers quickly turned into 13. 13 against what? They got in his face. They screamed at him. They called him names. They swore at him. They put their hands on him. And the group of six, they became brave. The group of six became brave to the point that they circle him and start taunting him. They do this to a man who has done nothing, absolutely nothing to them. Then, when that man, Mr. Mew, tries to create some space between him and Madison Cohen, they punch. They punch him. They push him. They slap him. They hit him again. They choke him from all directions. And Nick Mew <coughs> acts in self-defense. That's what happened on July 30th, 2022. I just want to give you guys a little bit of an indication as to kind of where I'm going to go and more importantly what I think you need to think about when you are back there thinking about the evidence, okay? First is the law. One, there is no duty to retreat, period. That is the only requirement. In this state, bullies like Madison Cohen don't get to tell us where to go. Bullies like Madison Cohen don't get to get in our face and require that we leave. That's not a requirement here. Keep that in mind. Two, subjective beliefs. Okay? When you're listening to the... Or, contemplating the evidence and replaying it in your mind, you are to do that and consider the beliefs, not the actions, but the beliefs of Mr. Mew. And when you do that, you are to do that from his perspective. At the time that the events were occurring. So while we have a video that video is from the perspective of Juwan Cockfield. The video perspective that the jury is required to consider it is as Nick Mew is holding the camera. I'm going to address this a little bit later, but the idea of provocation. Whether or not Nick intentionally caused harm to Madison Cohen. That is something that you should consider when you're considering provocation. And the other main one I want to talk about is what it means, because it's different here, beyond a reasonable doubt. So normally, beyond a reasonable doubt is this hurdle, and the state has to jump that hurdle in order to prove a case. It's a little bit different here. Okay. Because in this case, self-defense has been alleged. Remember when you're back there. Nick Mew doesn't have to prove he acted in self-defense. They have to prove 
beyond a reasonable doubt that he didn't act in self-defense. They have to prove that his beliefs were unreasonable. Okay? So, the way that I look at this video, the main video of Juwan Cockfield, we've already seen, we've all seen the nine second video where he's screaming at Mr. Mew, calling him a raper. I'm not talking about that one. Talking about the video that you've seen probably more than you want to. But I'm breaking that up into really three parts, okay? Zero to 149 is the first part, all right? Before anything actually happens in terms of the attack. And what, it, what is in dispute in that first minute and 49 seconds? I think two things were raised in the case that are, were in dispute. And that is, first, whether or not these drunk teens were actually afraid of Mr. Me. Right? They, I think to a person, they testified, yeah, we were really concerned about Mr. Me. Does, and you get to use your everyday experiences in life when you decide what to believe. Does that look to you like teenagers who are afraid of that person? Is that what that looks like to you? Does this photo of drunk teenagers taunting him, does that make you believe in your experiences in life? that they're afraid of him? Or is this what drunk teenagers who are terrified, is that what they look like? Does that make sense to you? Because you heard this. As the numbers rose, as the number of people grew, their fear, it decreased. And you've heard Mr. Anderson say over and over again, all Nick Mew had to do was walk away. Well, you heard from each one of those tubers, those drunk teenagers, we could have passed. When he walked over by Madison Cohen, we could have passed. And you heard Owen Pelican. I didn't want to pass. I wanted to see how this was going to play out. Why? Because Juwan Packfield was recording this entire incident. They wanted to see what was going to happen. They're not afraid. They want to see how this is going to play out. And Juwan Packfield said it best of all. It's for the culture. He wanted to put it on the internet so other people could see. And when you're using your everyday experiences in life, ask yourself this. Do people who are afraid of other people, do they walk up on them? Is that what people do when you're afraid of someone? <coughs> or do you try to get away from them? If you're afraid of someone, do you taunt them? Do you call them names? Do you circle around them? Those are questions that you all can answer. Or an alternative hypothesis to them being terrified is do they do those things because they're drunk teenagers and what they want to do is make a video and put it on the internet? Which one of those two things, based on the evidence that you've seen, which one of those things makes more sense to you? The second thing that I think is in dispute, or was at least raised in the first minute and 49 seconds of that video, is whether or not Nick Muse looking for little girls. Now, Mr. Anderson gets up here and says, no, he wasn't looking for little girls. But he also says, the boys didn't invent that. 
No, they pretty much invented that. And why do we, or how do we know that? So that's not on video anywhere, right? They don't mention it, they don't say anything about Nick Mew telling them that, right? Every one of them who speaks to the police provides a statement about what happened. Zero. Zero mention to the police that he said he was looking for little girls. This gentleman over here, Investigator Schultz, I think he said that he was a sensitive crimes investigator. He saw some of this stuff come across his desk, and that would have interested him. Investigator did testify, said if he would have mentioned, if any of these kids would have mentioned little girls, I would have taken note of that. So, what's the alternative? Why did they say that? I would submit to you that what kind of person does what these kids did to him, and what would they look like as people if all they did was pick a guy out and start to torment him? What do we think of people who do that? <coughs> what do we think of people who call grown men rapers and pedophiles and predators for kicks? What do, we, what do we think of those people? They had to come in and say that. Because if they don't, we know what we think of them. That's the reason. They came in, and they said this to you guys under oath. They got on that witness stand and swore to tell the truth, and they told you that he said he was looking for little girls. Well, the cops got up under oath and told you, no, nah, they never mentioned that to me. What are the odds? What are the odds that that actually happened and nobody mentions it to the police? What are the odds? Two other little points on that. In your everyday experiences in life, would you expect a man that you never met to walk up to you and say, if you ask him, how's your day? What are you doing? Oh, I'm looking for little girls. Would you expect someone to actually do that? Does that make any sense to you? He's with his wife. There, he has lunch with his wife and his friends. In order to believe what these drunk teenagers are saying, you have to believe that he has lunch with his wife, he's with his friends, they're having a fine time. Ariel loses his phone, and Nick goes, this is my chance. My wife's right over there, but this is my chance to go look for little girls. And I'm going to tell a bunch of drunk teenagers I've never met before, that's what I'm doing. Tell me that makes sense to you. Because you get to judge the credibility of what people have said to you. Okay? But I want to talk about what we know in that first minute and 49 seconds of the video. What do we know? We know, based on the evidence, that Nick's looking for a phone. We know that. Ariel said that. Nick said that. They find Ariel's phone in the river. So we know that. We know that Nick comes up to the teenager's tubes, and we know that Cockfield is looking for a phone, and Cockfield's holding the phone. Joanne Cockfield's holding the phone. We know that Nick Mew walks away from them as he passes them. We know that. We know, right, that the drunk teenagers move toward him and start confronting him. We know that. We also know that Nick sees what he believes to be a reasonable, rational adult. So he heads over there to talk to her. 
And what we know is you can see his thumb. He's motioning back, trying to explain what happened. And we know that Madison Cohen, who knows nothing about what happened, zero, starts screaming at him to leave. We know that Madison Cohen feels comfortable enough to put her hands on him for the first time and move him because, well, she's queen of the river and she decides where people go. So she's moving him. We know that. We know that Nick is uncomfortable, so he waves for his group to come over because the state can say whatever they want. He's by himself. So we know Nick does that. We know that when Nick waves to his group, so does Madison Cohen. But there's one big difference here. Her group shows up. And they show up in numbers. We know that the group of teens are brave. And as this is going on, they start taunting this man who's done nothing to them. We know that. We know that Riley Matt Madison comes over and now she thinks it's necessary because she's been anointed something in the river and she gets to tell him where to go. So we know that she puts her hands on him. We know that Nick's uncomfortable enough that he waves the group over a second time, trying to get someone to come to his aid. We know that. We know that Madison Cohen pushes him, puts her hands on him again. He tells her not to touch him, but she does it anyway. We know at that point, it's 13 against 1. The other thing that we know, because we heard it, was someone in the group, the brave group of six, tells Nick and you, you got 10 seconds. In your everyday experiences in life, when someone tells you that you have 10 seconds, what normally comes after? If we have children, I'm going to count to three. You got 10 seconds to do this. Nothing's good is coming after that. It's reasonable in our experiences as adults to take that as a threat. Right? And if you think about it, they, are, they're, they all blamed. They didn't know it. But the guy holding the bag is Isaac. We know it's not Joanne Cockfield, and everybody else denied it. So who's left? Their buddy Isaac. They all blame, without saying his name, it's like, wasn't me, wasn't me, wasn't me. Well, they're saying it's the one person who isn't here. Right? That's what we know. We know... Everything here I just told you is what we know in the first minute and 49 seconds. And why does that matter? What Judge, does... Judge, I can't see the exhibits. Uh, and step up and move over to the side. <laughs> what does that matter? Why does this matter? Because one of the things you have to consider when you consider self-defense is Nick Mew's reasonable belief that there is going to be an imminent interference with his person. And when you add all of these things together, he has to subjectively believe that. As a jury, as you sit here today, we don't get to look at it and say, what would an objective, reasonable person do? Does Nick feel that way? Does Nick feel, with all of these things listed here, 
that there is an imminent inter unlawful interference with his person. And I would submit to you, he does. He told you he did. Okay? We're going to see the video one time, promise, broken up into those parts. What is he on? Whoa! 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 He's on camera. Guys, Tripping. Guys on <laughs> He's on 4K. Four K. Yo, the new iPhone got that good quality. What do you say? <laughs> yeah, what the hell? Who is this? Yes, yes, yes. From the for the culture! For the culture! Who is that? For the culture! Who is that? Who the hell is this? Go! It doesn't matter. He said he was looking for little girl! He said he was looking for little girl! You were looking for little girl? Yeah! We're gonna sell! I didn't have that part on camera, did I? What the hell is this guy's problem, bro? We're trying to have fun of him. He's gonna call you? He's gonna claim you! We don't want this one, bro! That is on camera! That is on camera! on camera! Oh, God! Oh, God! Oh, God! The second part of the video that I think is important, and Attorney Anderson's talked a little bit about it, is the really the one second that we don't get to see, right? The one second where the state is insinuating and is claiming that Madison Cohen was punched, and where Nick Mew has testified that he raises his arm to get her out of his space. So those are the two possibilities as to what happened in the video that you don't see. And I am, once again, asking that you use your everyday experiences in life when you make this determination, okay? And I understand that people in stressful situations don't get everything perfect. I get that. I'm not holding anybody to this exact standard, but what have we heard in order to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that this happened? Well, you heard A.J. Martin say that he grabbed her by the back of the hair and was slugging her from behind. Okay, no one else says that. You hear Alex Vang say, he slapped her with a right hand in the face. Then I say, Mr. Vang, how can that happen He's got a knife in his hand. And he says, you're right, that can't happen. He punched her. You hear Juwan Cockfield, who's not looking at it, he's holding his camera in another direction, says, he threw a hook at her. I saw that. Right? Madison Cohen says... <coughs> She said on direct examination, he hit me with a left hand to the left side of my face. And it sat there. Then when I asked her questions, and I said, can you explain how that's humanly possible? And her response was, you're right. 
I get lefts and rights wrong, he hit me on the other side. Okay. But the state says she had a heartbeat in her cheek. She should remember what side of her cheek the heartbeat was in. She doesn't get that right. But how about the things when you use your everyday experiences in life that the state they didn't talk about when he was up here talking about her injuries. He talks about her falling back and people seeing things. Okay, people can be wrong. How about things that make sense, though? We know that she's wearing sunglasses, right? We know that. Her sunglasses are not broken. She doesn't have a mark on her face from being cut by sunglasses. None of that. Is that what would happen if a 250 pound man squared up on a woman and threw a hook to her face? She doesn't have redness on her face. She doesn't have swelling on her face. She doesn't have puffiness, a bruise, or a mark. How do we know that? Investigator Schultz told us, I saw her shortly thereafter, and she didn't have a mark on her. He says, if I would have seen a mark, I would have taken a photograph of that mark. Makes sense, right? She doesn't drop her drink. She doesn't drop her vape. Her cell phone doesn't leave her bathing suit. Is that what happens when a 250 pound man squares up on a woman? She doesn't drop a thing and she doesn't have a mark. Does that make sense? to you all, or, or does it make more sense that Nick Mew pushes her out of his space? Attorney Anderson said she's not in his face. Well, most of her friends said, no, she was. She was in his face, she was in his face, she was in his space, right? If he makes this motion, She's not going to have broken sunglasses. She's not going to have a mark on her face. She's not going to have redness, puffiness, swelling, a bruise. She's not going to drop her drink because he doesn't hit her. Which one of those two things in your everyday experiences in life makes more sense? You get to decide that. And I want you to think about this. She knows the seriousness of the case. She tells the police she takes a photograph or photographs. Then she claims to have deleted them in a homicide case. <clears throat> then the police say, that's okay. That happens. You give us your phone, we can get the pictures. They do a cell bright download uh, extraction of her phone. Investigator Schultz doesn't do it, but he reviews it and says, ah, there's no deleted photos that I saw in there. He even goes so far as to reach out to Madison Cohen's mother because maybe she either took the photos or were sent the photos. No, not there either. You get to judge the credibility of people on whether or not that makes any sense. That is not provocation. And just briefly on retreat and provocation. I told you when I started, there is no duty to retreat. And that is true. That's the first sentence in the retreat instruction. If you want to, it says you may consider whether or not when he was retreating or if he had to retreat 
whether the defendant reasonably believed the amount of force used was necessary to terminate the interference, you may consider whether he had the opportunity to retreat. Okay? Now, you don't have to, but when it starts, when it matters, is when he's using the force. And when he's doing that, he's surrounded. He told you he was surrounded. I asked uh, Lieutenant Hart, do you have any information that would be uh, contrary to Nick Mew's belief or statement that he was surrounded? She said, no, I don't. Where's he going to go? So he doesn't have to go anywhere. We don't let people dictate what we do, and the loudest voice in the room doesn't have to win. Madison Cohen doesn't get to make these decisions for people. He doesn't have to leave. The drunk teenagers don't have to leave either. They told you they could have left, but they wanted to see the show. doesn't have to go, and there's nowhere to go. That should be the beginning, middle, and end of that evaluation on retreat. Same analysis, same result on provocation, okay? You have to find that Nick Mew committed an, un an unlawful conduct against Madison Cohen to provoke this attack. He wanted her to get out of his personal space. The bully in the room doesn't get to yell at you and tell you to leave, and then when you don't leave, doesn't get to get in your personal space because you are not leaving. That's not how this works. The last part of the video is the 150 to 205 mark, okay? Now, you heard yesterday, the state wants to break this video, this last 15 seconds or so, down into stills. One twenty-fourth of a second. No one lives their life in one twenty-fourth of a second. And you're not supposed to in this case, because you're supposed to look at this case through the eyes of Nick Me. And if, you, if you've watched that video, the first time I saw it, I didn't see what happened. I didn't see him pull a knife. I didn't see some of these people getting injured. Because it's moving like this. When you break it down to 1 24th of a second, it's just not how we live our lives. You have to look at those 14 seconds through Nick Mew's eyes as he was standing there in the river. And remember, he told you yesterday that he believed that he was going to die. But he doesn't have to believe that. He just has to believe that he's going to suffer serious bodily injury. That's what he has to believe. Okay? And before I start this video, I'm going to ask you this again. What do we know <clears throat> in those last 15 seconds? We know that Anthony and Dante Carlson were asked by their dad to go over there. Why? To help him. Quentin Carlson testified that he was concerned that Nick Mew was going to get the brakes beat off of him. So Quentin Carlson wanted his boys to go assist. I would submit to you that Quentin Carlson was concerned that Nick Mew was going to suffer serious bodily injury if someone didn't help him. Alex Vang told you he's getting... Mew's getting his butt kicked when this is going on. 
And Owen Pelquin said those guys got on his ass. Right? Anthony Carlson is yelling, stop, stop, stop. He's not yelling it to Nick Mew. Nick Mew's tail down in the water. Presumably, he's telling it to the people who are beating him. Right? That's what we know. Now, Juwan Cockfield found that to be funny for quite some time. You can hear him cackling on how he thinks it's funny that Mew's getting punched in the face and knocked in the face, slapped, okay? But what we know from that video is a 250-pound man, 250-pound man, has been knocked clean off his feet backwards into the water by getting punched in the jaw. That's what we know. We know that in one second, Dante Carlson, who throws that punch, runs around to the other side of Nick Mew while he's still on his back, kind of on his lower, I'm sorry, on his butt, kind of on his lower back, and he cracks him across the face. We know that. That's not in dispute. We know that A.J. Martin, who says he's trying, he's the peacekeeper, that's what he said, he runs up from behind and shoves Nick Mew while Dante Carlson comes in for thirds and smacks Nick Mew in the face again. I would submit to you at this point, it's coming from all sides and from multiple people. And this man, who had heart surgery, is terrified as to what's going on. We know, well, let me just remind you of this. At this point, after he's been punched, slapped, pushed, slapped, he hasn't stabbed anyone. Right? And if you listened closely to what A.J. Martin said in his testimony, when he was shown the picture of him making contact with Mr. Mew before Mr. Mew stabbed him, he said, he got me before I got him, I guess. What does that tell you about what A.J. Martin's intention is? He's back in the water now for a third time after getting pushed down uh, by A.J. Martin. And what do we see next? That's Anthony Carlson. He walks right by me. Mew doesn't do a thing to him. Mr. Mew doesn't do a thing to Anthony Carlson as he walks by. You will then see, and what we know is Anthony Carlson comes up from behind him, appears to be yelling at him, and putting his hands on him. So now Mew has been touched at that point, punched, pushed, pushed from behind and slapped. And now Anthony Carlson comes up to him. We know that. And then we know one second later that Isaac Schumann comes up to him. You guys get to make the decision on whether or not he's choking him around the neck. You get to make that decision. I'm not telling you what that is. You get to decide if that looks like a choke to you or not. So at that point, four people have attacked Nick Mew. And why does it matter? Why does any of that matter? Because if you find the following, Nick Mew is not guilty of all the charges. Okay? If you find that Nick Mew believed, that he believed that there was an imminent unlawful interference with his person, if you believe that he believed that, that that was coming, 
the 19 or 18 reasons that I put up there supports that, and he told you that. And that's his subjective beliefs. Okay? If he believed the amount of force that he used was necessary to terminate that interference, okay? So if he believed that he, he did what he had to do, I would submit to you there's only two answers to that. Only two possible answers. He either did what he had to do to survive, or this man who, you watch the video, who's never got a speeding ticket, who decides to go out with his wife that day, who's floating down the river and having lunch, decides, you know what, today's the day I'm going to start stabbing people. I'm going to leave my group, I'm going to go over and I'm going to start stabbing people. Mr. Anderson says he snapped. If he was in fear, he would have left. I think anybody would dispute that he was in fear. So when you're determining whether or not what he did, if he believed that he had to do that to terminate that interference, I would submit to you, why else would he do it? He either believed that or he just lost his mind. Right? This 52-year-old engineer who's married just lost his mind that day. Those are the two options, I think, that you have on that. And the final thing that you need to decide is whether or not his beliefs were reasonable. And the standard is would an ordinary person, I'm sorry, an ordinary, a person of ordinary intelligence and prudence would have believed standing in his shoes at that moment, okay? Quentin Carlson is about his age, and Quentin Carlson is concerned enough for his safety that he sends his boys over. Quentin Carlson tells the police that after his boys have been injured. He tells the police, I get it, they're injured. I sent them over there because I was concerned for the old guy. Brandy Hart. Did you watch that video yesterday? There's a point in that video where Nick Mew puts his hand in his head and says to something like, my life is over. And Brandy Hart says, I don't know about that. Their self-defense. She says, I don't know what I would have done. But I can tell you I would have been scared shitless. She's been a police officer for 25 years. And that is her response. State never followed up with her on anything after that. That was her statement to the police, or that was her statement on the tape. And as I mentioned, Alex Vang and Owen Pelequin say he's getting his butt kicked. They're all over him. Are those reasonable people? You get to decide what a reasonable person would do in that situation. But I would submit to you, you've got something to work with. You've got something to work with. Briefly on the charges, okay? Before you even get to self-defense, you get to intent. You have to find intent on uh, the homicide charges initially for Isaac Schumann, and you have to find them for the others involved, okay? And the question on intent is mental purpose. Can you watch that video and, and say that Nick Mew's mental purpose is to kill Isaac Schumann? Or is his mental purpose to get another person off of him? You get to decide that. Okay. Under those circumstances, you heard everybody say, Anybody who never touched him, he never touched. Right? People were like, 
I didn't want to get near him. They didn't touch him. He didn't touch them. He didn't say anything. You get to consider all the facts and circumstances. He didn't say anything to Isaac. Right? Isaac grabs him by the throat, and he stabs him one time. Is that an intent? Is that his intention to kill Isaac Shiva? And when you started this case, you heard that was the charge. Well, those charges have changed. Now you get to consider all other kinds of charges, with all other kinds of mental states too, right? Maybe it was intentional. Well, maybe not. Maybe it was reckless. Pick a theory. Don't let them just throw things against the wall and hope that you guys let something stick. They're telling you they thought it was intentional. Now it might not be. Now it might be reckless. They don't have it. Nick Mew wanted to get Isaac Schumann away from him. He didn't chase Isaac Schumann down. He didn't move toward Isaac Schumann. Isaac Schumann moved toward him. And on the attempted homicide, read the instruction on attempt, you guys. In order to convict someone of an attempted homicide, the state must prove to you beyond a reasonable doubt that demonstrates unequivocally that Nick wanted to kill these people and would have, except for the intervention of another person or some other extraneous factor. Okay? And unequivocally means there can be no other inference which can reasonably be drawn. No other inference. And an extraneous factor is some, something outside the control of Nick. You heard D.A. Anderson say, but for medical intervention, some of these people would have died. Well, A.J. Martin would have. Dante Carlson had a hernia. He repaired a hernia. I'm sorry, the medical intervention doesn't prevent him. He's not going to die from that. Anthony Carlson gets two stitches. He's certainly not going to die from that. And Riley Madison could have got an infection, they said. I understand that. But if he wanted to kill them, why didn't he? He's... If you believe Attorney Anderson, he's alone with Dante Carlson. Why does he stab him one time if he wants to kill him? Why doesn't he smash him up? He wants what he wanted all along, to get away from these people. He's leaving and Dante Carlson, who has beaten him up, has hit him in the face repeatedly, confronts him again. What does he think? What does Nick Mew believe is about to happen? You don't have to let somebody beat you before you respond. Doesn't that make sense? And because we don't, because they don't have the attempts here, because there was nothing no outside extraneous factor. They also say, might not be attempts. Take a, check, take a chance on reckless. How about that? Again, not really a theory, but you get to make that decision. I'm going to comment on the video, because I think it's appropriate, that was played, the interview with Nick and Brandy Hart. He lies about the knife. He lies about the knife. What he and what Lieutenant Hart said is he's never wavered on is that this was self-defense, that he was fearful, and that he was being attacked. Okay, that He's never wavered on that. He said it over 20 times in the interview, and it's the first words out of his mouth when he's, when he's interviewed by Lieutenant Hart. 
some people get some facts wrong, some people lie about stuff. He's not telling you the truth about the knife. But, does it change one thing that you saw on that video? That's the reason we want there to be a video. Is so you're not taking the word of 11 people, sorry, 13 people who don't get it right. That video is not subject to change. Attorney Anderson's right. It is what it is, right? What has persevered through this case is Nick Mew's fear, how he felt, the shock. You heard people testify about that. The whiteness, the wide eyes, the ghost-looking color of his skin. That has persevered through this case. He lied about the knife. Doesn't change one thing that's on that video. You should feel sympathy for Isaac Schumann's family. I have a 19 year old son, he would be in Isaac Schumann's grade right now. Everyone feels sympathy for Isaac Schumann. I'm sure he was a wonderful kid, and I know that his parents love him, but you don't get to decide this case based on sympathy. The judge tells you that. You decide this case based on facts and evidence. That's what you are required to do, and put most succinctly in terms of the burden of proof and what the state has to do is they have to prove to you beyond a reasonable doubt it's not self-defense. And what does reasonable doubt mean? Well, the judge read it to you. You'll get to hear about it again. But it's a doubt that would cause a person of ordinary prudence to pause or hesitate when deciding the most important affairs of life. And I would submit to you the most important affairs of your, your collective lives are your health, your family's health, loved one's health. When you're thinking about that and, you're, and you have to make hard decisions on those things, if there is a pause or hesitation about what you need to do because you're getting information from various places, and you say, I need a break, I need to, I need to figure this out, that's reasonable doubt. Okay. It is a doubt for which a reason can be given. That reason is self-defense. And I just want you guys to know this. When you go back there and you have those verdict forms, if, it's, if you believe it's self-defense, he's not guilty. If you believe it's probably self-defense, he's not guilty. If you believe it's possibly self-defense, he's not guilty. You're like, it likely is, I don't know, not guilty. If you believe it might not be, not guilty. If you believe it's probably not self-defense, not guilty. All of those considerations that you would have require a verdict of not guilty. Because the state has to prove to you beyond a, beyond a reasonable doubt that it wasn't self-defense. So, as I go to sit down, we, Attorney Nelson, Nick, you and I, appreciate all of your time. The time that you've taken away from your families and friends to do this. The attentiveness that you've given us. Um, and I think it's time uh, for people to go home when you're done. And, what we're asking that you do is that you send Nick Mew home. That you find him not guilty on all of the charges. Thank you. While we swap people out, if you'd like to stand and stretch for a moment, you may do so. And then we'll hear a brief rebuttal from Mr. Smith. -Dowd.
you just heard Mr. Trotsky say his entire defense is based on what Nick Mew told you during his testimony was thoughts in his head, the beliefs in his head. What do we know about Nick Mew? We know he's smart, speaks multiple languages, has a couple of degrees, one's in math. He's a calculating person. He's a cunning person. He's a skilled and prolific liar. We know that because every word that came out of his mouth, practically, since he started walking away from this group, was a lie, including to his best friend, who he said they took my knife, while the knife is still on him. The things he said to Sheriff Knudsen, where he pretended to not know what was going on. And then everything he said to Investigator Hart, Lieutenant Hart. He is skillful at crafting a story that matches what he needs to say to avoid the consequences for his actions. We all know that. It's undisputed. He told you himself. He's a liar. All right? He did not just not lie about the knife. He lied about all kinds of crazy things, bizarre things. Why would he say that these boys pulled his pants down? What a bizarre lie to make up, right? Why would he say that two boys pulled knives on him? He's got to say that because he knows what he did wasn't justified. He thinks to himself, if I say one boy pulled a knife, that would be good. But if it's two, that would be better. So he crafts this elaborate story. His entire defense rests on you believing what he said on the stand yesterday. His testimony was a disaster. He got caught in several lies on the stand. He changed his answers a couple of times when he realized that what he said wasn't helpful to his defense, right? He consistently remembered details from July 30th, 2022, that benefits his defense, but doesn't remember anything about what he did, any of the facts, any of the stories that he told uh, Lieutenant Hart. How is that possible that he could only remember the facts, the beliefs he had that assist his defense, and nothing else? How many times did he say on the stand, I don't remember, I don't remember, I don't remember. He repeated it over and over and over again because he doesn't want to answer questions about what he did because he knows dang well it wasn't justified. He's lying. He's lying. One of the many things I'm going to be grateful about when this is done is that I never have to hear again that the actions he took that day was the fault of these boys. That's ridiculous. It's despicable. There has never been any explanation from the defense as to why Nick Mew ran up on these boys, why they grabbed, why he grabbed their tubes, why he was groping around for their legs were. They don't even respond to it. They, they, didn't, they didn't bring it up. There is no explanation. That behavior is inexplicable. He's a bizarre person. He made bizarre choices that day. It is not their fault. It is not their fault. I'll say it a hundred times. It's not their fault. These boys have beat themselves up every day since this happened. You saw the raw emotion on the stand. Their best friend was murdered by this guy. And to say that it's their fault is despicable. Nobody's responsible for Nick Mew's choices but him himself. He chose violence at every turn. There's been some question about whether he's fragile. Part of him is fragile. His ego is fragile. As his attorney had said early last week, when he's questioning these boys, you were trying to humiliate him. You were trying to insult him. You were taunting him. He was humiliated. He was insulted. He didn't like these boys uh, treating him like that. He certainly didn't like Madison Cohen getting in his face, so to speak. And eventually, he did just snap. He pulls his knife out, getting ready for violence, pulls it out, holds it down where nobody can see it, holds it at his side, and then hits her. That started the violence. He prepared for the violence before he started it. 
he felt humiliated and he wasn't going to let it go. I asked him, did you ever take a step back at any time when she was yelling at you? No. With no explanation. We're dealing with what we call false narratives in this case. Things that the defense repeats over and over and over again, hoping that you think it's fact, okay? One of these is this 13 to one narrative, okay? We've heard it 100 times in this trial. This is not a 13 to one situation. We've got the 16 age boy standing on the side by their tubes. He's confronted by the two girls. Everybody else is in the background. He hits Madison Cohen when he's only got two girls standing in front of him. After the fight, it's one-on-one -on -one to start. It's Dante hitting him, and then arguably two-on-one -on -one when AJ comes up and pushes him in the back. Tony breaks it up. The fight's done. He gets them off. And AJ, of course, is already tore open, so he's laying in the river. But that's the end of the fight. Mr. Mew continued violence. He chose more violence after that part of the fight was done. Tony, who did exactly what his dad told him to do, came up to try to break it up. You can hear him telling Dante, his brother, get away, get back. Mr. Mew turns around and stabs him, and Tony blocks it and stabs him again. He chose violence at every turn. This another false narrative. They circled him. They surrounded him. Baloney. You've seen the video how many times there's open water everywhere. That he was attacked from all directions. False narrative. He said that Owen Pelequin testified that they stuck around because they wanted to see how it played out. That's true, but what he didn't mention is that Owen also said he wanted to make sure he didn't do anything to this woman. And you know what? Those instincts were exactly right. Those instincts were right. He keeps talking about how these boys wanted to make a video. Well, they were making a video. And what, what does that matter? They didn't start the violence. None of those boys laid a hand on him, despite the fact that he touched both Joan Cockfield and Landon Wire when he ran up on them in their tubes. Nobody laid a hand on him until after he had already stabbed a number of people. Isaac Schumann tried to stop him. He got killed for his efforts. He seems to be arguing, the defense seems to be arguing that Isaac somehow deserved it. I, I don't understand that argument. He's trying to protect people. He calls Maddie Cohen the queen of the river, and he calls her a bully, calls her a number of other unkind things. Her testimony was, and it's clear from the video, she was trying to protect these boys. She saw that he was over there doing something, that it was freaking them out. She tried to protect them. You know, maybe if we had more people on the river trying to protect people, the people of the world would be a better place. They've made, over and over, they've argued that you know, Maddie was never punched because she has no marks on her face. Nick Mew, who, as Mr. Trofsky said, was lifted off of his feet by the punch from Dante, and punched in the jaw and fell in the river, gets up and there's no marks on his face. We have pictures from him, we have the, the video, we have his interview with uh, Lieutenant Hart later, we have the, the pictures that the jail nurse took five hours after. There's no bruising, there's no puffiness, there's no swelling. The fact that they're arguing that Maddie had no mark doesn't matter because he didn't either. It happens. They're trying to, they're trying to say that he was terrified. His face tells a different story. He has expressions of anger. He has expressions of, um, I guess, humor. He's smiling. He's smirking. Well, he, after he has his knife out, he clearly feels comfortable. There's no look of terror in his face at any time. K 
A.J. Martin was not armed. He pushed Mr. Mew in the back. We know that. He didn't kick him. He didn't punch him. He didn't hold his head underwater. He pushed him in the back. And for that, he got a incision on his body from his belt line all the way up. You saw the pictures. It's horrible. He used no weapon against Mr. Mew. They made a big deal about Lieutenant Hart telling uh, Mr. Neal in the interview that she would have been scared too. Well, she made that response after he'd been feeding her a load of BS about all this stuff that supposedly happened. About having two kids pulling knives on him and pulling his pants down and all the baloney that he, that he fed her. Based on that, she said, yeah, I would have been scared too. They're arguing that he had no intent to kill Isaac. Isaac weighed 100 and I think 134 pounds at the time. He's 250. He rams his knife up, up, not down, up, severing two of Isaac's ribs right into his heart. All right? If he didn't intend to kill him, why not stab him in the belly? Right into his heart. We've heard no explanation whatsoever as to why he stabbed Riley Madison. We know from the video she's standing off in the background after Tony's trying to break it up. He just walked over and stabbed her. She wasn't attacking him. They don't explain that because there is no explanation. None. He wasn't in fear for his life from Riley Madison. She said she was 110 pounds now, might have been 115 back then. There's no fear for his life. He just was mad because she touched him. They've talked a little bit about the extraneous factors. It's not just medical attention that uh, can be an extraneous factor. As we know, multiple people on the river stopped to help these folks, putting compressions on. Um, one witness said they used a sandwich bag to try to make a chest compression. There was a lot of interventions for these folks. We know with Riley Madison specifically that Larry and Davis and his brother, we saw it on the video, got her to shore on a tube. Um, people went out of their way to help these folks. This, these are extraneous factors. But another extraneous factor is he just got unlucky. You know, if he, as, as Mr. Anderson had said, we've got arteries, we've got organs. Dr. Meyer said, you know, whenever you have a, an abdomen uh, wound, you have to check all those things. It's kind of a miracle that more people didn't get killed. It's not by anything he did. He just got lucky. Missed major organs and arteries. The bottom line is he had four hours from the time that he was arrested to the time that he concocted this ridiculous story about uh, the boys pulling knives on him and pulling his pants down and all this other bizarre baloney. He used his intellect, because we know he's smart, to craft this story. And he was very deliberate and detailed because he wanted to come up with a story that he thought would be sufficient to convince people that he acted in self-defense. We know he lied about all of it. So now today, He's saying, well, sure, I lied about everything I said when I talked to Lieutenant Hart about what happened, but now I'm telling the truth. So now believe me. No, no, no. You have my full confidence. I know you're going to return a just verdict of guilty and deliver justice to Isaac Schumann and everybody else who got hurt by this man. Thank you. And another good morning uh, from me. I am Paul Bloom, Fox 9 News in our Fox 9 Streaming Center. You're, of course, watching our ongoing gavel to gavel coverage of the Apple River stabbing trial. We're coming up on 11 a.m. Central Time. Um, we don't know what is happening right now inside the Hudson Courtroom in St. Croix County Circuit Court, but you can tell from this feed uh, 
uh, that shows the seal. There are certainly some heads moving in the courtroom, and we are told by our crew on scene, we have Fox 9 reporter Rob Olson there, uh, reporting that the attorneys have come back and a significant number of deputies uh, have returned and are inside the courtroom. We have no confirmation at this point that there's a verdict. Uh, the jury has come back now twice over the last 24 hours uh, since getting the case at 1227 yesterday to watch uh, uh, the video, uh, the Juwan Cockfield cell phone video a couple of times. But Rob reporting that uh, this uh, is a different level of um, of activity, of movement. Uh, the lawyers going in, the deputies in the courtroom. Uh, at last check with Rob a couple minutes ago, he said the, uh, the media uh, and any public uh, in the courtroom or at the courthouse today for any developments are not being allowed in. So something's happening inside the courtroom. Uh, we have rules on, on, on our camera feed uh, in the way the court is allowing us to televise and broadcast this case to you. So we do have to keep this uh, camera locked on the seal. We're not allowed to pan in and around the courtroom until the judge is in there. So unfortunately, we only have sort of what I would describe as half information uh, at this point, but there certainly is activity uh, in that courtroom at that courthouse in Hudson, Wisconsin. Uh, while we wait and take a look um, and just a wait word, official word from, from the court on what is going on. Uh, we have not uh, gotten any, and I will point out that uh, uh, what it's been, uh, looking at the clock here, uh, more than 10 minutes since that activity started uh, ratcheting up. Uh, we have no court confirmation at this point, uh, but we will continue to watch that. And with that, we'll keep that camera angle up. I do have Marsh Hallberg, criminal defense attorney, Hallberg, criminal defense, joining us uh, to just to offer some insight as, as we sort of just wait. Uh, we're, all, we're all just waiting on this, Marsh. I'm just wondering your thoughts uh, when you hear uh, more activity, lawyers going in, deputies in the courthouse. Is your hunch that, that, that we could be getting close, that this isn't just a question, this could be a verdict? Right. The, one of the things we always look for, if there are deputies that are coming into the courtroom, that means that uh, we're thinking more likely we may have a verdict that's going to come back. Because sometimes people are out of custody and they're going to get taken in and they want to make sure they have enough deputies to deal with that. And or if there's anger between spectators, sometimes the two sides need to kind of be separated and have them have them leave the courtrooms at separate times so they don't uh, get into each other's faces in the hallways. So when we see that, we're thinking we've got a verdict if we've got more deputies that are there. Uh, it could be it could be other things, though, right, Paul? It, it could be simply they could have a question for the for the uh, judge. And the way they do that is it's, it's very formal. They can't just send a note back to the judge. Hey, we've got a question about a, a jury instruction or whatever it might be. They have to bring them back in the courtroom so both attorneys hear the questions at the same time. They can both make a record as to what if the judge has to respond to a question from jurors as to how they think the judge should respond or what the verbiage should be, they don't control that. They can have input with the judge for what the recommended response may be. So, for example, if the jury came back and said, we've reached an impasse, we can't reach a verdict on half the counts or all the counts or whatever, likely what the judge is going to do is say, go on back and keep trying. So that could be just one example. Again, as you and I chatted about early this morning, Wisconsin is different than Minnesota that every time you want to see a clip, you got to come back into the courtroom and that can be very time consuming. So uh, this will be what our could be our third trip back to do that kind of a thing. And that's kind of why Minnesota just says keep the uh, a, you know, a DVD or a video player back there with you and uh, you watch as much as you want. And Marsh, I just keep reminding our viewers at this point, we're at 1101. Obviously, the clock doesn't really matter at this point. It's just a matter of when, when the jury reaches unanimous verdicts up and down 21 total counts in this deadly stabbing encounter. Uh, by my loose math, uh, we have nothing official from the courthouse. Uh, they deliberated for about three hours yesterday. When you think about them getting the case around 1230, they were going to have some lunch. So if they start at 1, they went home at 4.30. They came into court a few minutes before that. So they put in about three hours yesterday. They got going. They were ready to go to watch that video at 8 a.m. this morning. So we're at 11. So maybe about three hours. We're about six hours into uh, deliberations. Um, is that enough time? I mean, I, we've seen juries come back in one hour. We've seen them come back over four days, uh, six hours for this type of case. Uh, uh, would that be enough time in your estimation to, to reach unanimous consent on all of these charges? Yeah, it certainly could be. And sometimes, like I said, they may have a big global approach to this. They might go around the room and go, does anybody think 
that this is a you know first degree homicide case that there's an intent to have killed anybody if there is they, everybody says no then let's folk that knocks out all those charges in just moments right then they're down to talk about whether it's reckless homicide because that could well be the split if there is going to be a split here you know dump the first degree and, and convict them of the reckless uh, nothing official from the courthouse, but our, our, our reporter on scene is reporting that some of the parties that are returning to the courthouse have been told they, they should get back for a, quote, verdict. Um, yep. Again, we're going to stop you, short you of... About, I'm sorry. No, no, just that we're going to stop short, but involved parties um, at the courthouse at least saying that. Are they telling the truth? We still have not gotten official confirmation on a verdict, but um, it, it would sound like uh, it may be in, imminent. Now I'm being told by Rob, a deputy has confirmed a verdict. Deputy on site of the courthouse confirming a verdict as uh, Isaac um, Schumann's friends have also done that with Rob Olson. So now, Mars, we turn to, I, I suppose, uh, deputy confirming it. It's, it's, it's coming. Um, what's going on at the courthouse right now? I tell you, the, the tension, if, for anybody that ever has the ability to do that, if, when you can be, like, especially like on a murder one case, right, that you could be out of a courtroom waiting for that decision to come back here. Everybody's trying to act cool in the courtroom, the attorneys, the defendant, but you, their hearts are pounding out of their chest because it's, you know, it's a very dramatic thing. Just like to some extent, this is accurate. Like you see on TV, they have the defendant rise. Uh, they can then uh, ask for the verdict forms. There's all this drama. The, the, the paperwork is handed from the four person who you then learn who the four person is, is they're the one holding the verdict forms hand them over to a deputy or a clerk who then hands them up to the judge who reads them for a moment and it feels like hours for for you to get through all of that it's it's a very tense time i know we're going into total speculation mode but i've covered enough trials the, the consensus typically is if it's short right it favors the defense yeah. i i would I'd, I'd have to agree here right if if, if it's full self-defense then it probably we get unanimous consent that he's not guilty on on every count right uh, yeah, otherwise it, it otherwise you start nitpicking like oh you know was it intentional was it reckless uh, what degree of it I, I would think then if we're starting to debate um other counts then it comes out of black and white and becomes a whole bunch of gray and the jury would take a while that's just my gut uh your thoughts on, on again six hours which is is sort of on the shorter end of a deliberation for a case like this in my opinion yeah, excellent uh, gut reaction by you, Paul, because that is true. If they really wanted to burrow down on each separate victim and each separate set of charges, that can take an awful lot of time. That's why I would speculate that I think they made some big global decisions, like maybe all of the, either, like I said, self-defense and everything were done, or maybe it's not homicide and it's just the reckless homicide charges. There's a big way to cut your workload in half in moments. Or like you said, or maybe what, you know what, this is all BS, the guy should have walked away and the defense is BS and we're just convicting him of everything and let's go, let's go to lunch. And I did, uh, we just now got official word from our courthouse comms that there is a verdict uh, that is to be read in 10 or 15 minutes. So confirm mm -hmm. verdict, we can run the uh, bulletin on our screen. It is 11.05 central time. There is a verdict in the Nikolai Miu uh, murder case. Uh, he was facing 21 counts in total. Um, Ryan, why don't we throw up the charges and have Marsh uh, kind of uh, go through them with us if we can. Uh, the top count from the outset was first degree intentional homicide. That, of course, in the death of Nick, uh, excuse me, in the death of Isaac Schumann. And you go down from there, second degree intentional. And then those reckless homicide counts of bottom three um, uh, evolving over the last uh, 48 hours with the state adding so-called lesser included. Um, your thoughts as, as a jury has, has reached unanimous, uh, uh, unanimous decision on those counts. And then here, uh, the survivors, those stabbed that day. Um, I, just, I, I just wonder what's going through your head as you see these counts and, and recognize that the jury did reach a relatively quick uh, a verdict here. Yeah, I, I think you know, if the, everybody's kind of being a betting man right now. Their defense is feeling pretty good that on that many counts or that many serious charges are coming back that quickly. My experience has been that a jury is knowing what murder one is, that the, the consequence of that, whether it's life or death in some states, that um, that's something they're not going to reach lightly and they're going to debate that and re-debate Marsh, that. Marsh, we got to cut you off. The judge yep. is already on the bench. The judge on the bench, Michael Waterman, is in court. The defendant's there. Uh, he's now to the left uh, on the other side of Aaron Nelson, uh, left side of his defense attorney. The jury is coming in. A verdict has been reached. We should 
hear Nikolai Miu's fate in mere moments. All right, please be seated. <laughs> All right, we are back in session on the record in State of Wisconsin versus Nikolai Mew. Uh, the attorneys are present with Mr. Mew. Twelve jurors are in the courtroom. Mr. Ashland, I understand you are the foreperson. Correct. Did your jury reach a verdict? Yeah. Did you reach a verdict on each of the six counts? Yes, we did. Okay, please hand the verdict forms to the bailiff. Verdicts read as follows. As to count one of the information, Isaac Schumann, the jury finds Nikolai Mew guilty of first degree reckless homicide as submitted. Question, did Mr. Mew commit the crime while using a dangerous weapon? Answer, yes. As to count two of the information, Alexander Martin, the jury finds Nikolai Mew guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as submitted. Did Mr. Mew commit the crime while using a dangerous weapon? Answer, yes. As to count three of the information, Dante Carlson, the jury finds Nikolai Mew guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as submitted. Did Mr. Mew commit the crime while using a dangerous weapon? Answer, yes. As to count four of the information, Anthony Carlson, the jury finds Nikolai Mew guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as submitted. Did Mr. Mew commit the crime while using a dangerous weapon? Answer, yes. As to count five of the information, Riley Madison, the jury finds Nikolai Mew guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as submitted. Did Mr. Mew commit the crime while using a dangerous weapon? Answer, yes. As to count six of the information, Madison Cohen, the jury finds Nikolai Mew guilty of battery as charged. Did Mr. Mew commit the crime while using a dangerous weapon? Answer, yes. Uh, members of the jury, uh, I do have to verify that this is in fact a unanimous verdict. Uh, so I'm going to ask each of you if I correctly read the verdict uh, and if you agree with it. Uh, so when I call your name, uh, if you agree with the verdict that I read, please answer by saying yes. If you disagree with the verdict, you can answer by saying no. Uh, Ms. Navarro, uh, do you agree with the verdict that I read? Yes. Uh, Mr. Cook, do you agree with the verdict that I read? Yes. Uh, Mr. Snell, do you agree with the verdict that I read? Yes. Ms. Pelzel, do you agree with the verdict that I read? Yes. Uh, Mr. Wiley, do you agree with the verdict that I read? Uh, Ms. Knapp, do you agree with the verdict that I read? Yes. Mr. Diedrich, do you agree with the verdict that I read? Yes. Ms. McMahon, do you agree with the verdict that I read? Yes. Mr. Henderlong, do you agree with the verdict that I read? Yes. Mr. Ashland, do you agree with the verdict that I read? Yes. Ms. McMullen, do you agree with the verdict that I read? Yes. Ms. Lewandowski, do you agree with the verdict that I read? Yes. Uh, any additional polling? No? All right. It is a unanimous verdict. Members of the jury, your service in this case is completed. Uh, you are free to read accounts about this trial. Uh, you are free to talk about this case with anyone. However, uh, you do not have to discuss this case with anybody or answer any questions about this case other than from the court. So this includes the parties, the lawyers, the media, or anybody else. If you do decide to discuss this case with anyone, Please treat any such discussion with a degree of solemnity, such that whatever you would say, you'd be willing to say in front of your fellow jurors or here in open court. It is in the public interest that there be the utmost freedom of debate in the jury room and that jurors be permitted to express their views without fear of incurring the anger of any litigants or the public. For that reason, please respect the privacy of the views of your fellow jurors. If you do decide to speak, please only speak for yourselves and not for anybody else. On behalf of my colleagues, Judges Needham, Vlack, and Nordstrand, along with my courtroom staff, 
Thank you for your participation in this important case. Court is now adjourned. Please take the jury out. All rise for the jury. Please be seated. <clears throat> Based on the unanimous verdict, I will enter uh, convictions on each of the six counts. Uh, bail is revoked. Uh, Mr. Mew will be held in custody pending sentencing. Um, my staff will contact uh, the attorneys and will schedule the sentencing date. I will order a pre-sentence investigation report, um, but we can uh, do the scheduling at a later time. Is there anything else, Mr. Anderson? No. Uh, Mr. Shroffacy? No, sir. All right. Thank you, everyone. Court is adjourned. Folks, if anybody on this side of the courtroom could please exit, anybody on this side, please stay. And good morning again. I am Paul Bloom, Fox 9 News, uh, here as we approach 11.15 Central Time in our Fox 9 Live Streaming Center. And that there is the camera going off on your screen. This case is now closed. Uh, jury in St. Croix County, Wisconsin, Hudson, Wisconsin there, finding Nikolai Mew guilty. Uh, I want to be careful with my verbiage. So he's found guilty uh, up and down uh, the number of counts he was facing for each of his victims there, but found guilty of lesser charges. So he escapes, obviously, uh, for him, uh, uh, the life imprisonment, the top count of first degree intentional homicide, second degree intentional homicide, but found guilty there, as you can see on your screen, first degree reckless homicide. So that charge was what we would call lesser included, a lesser included charge of murder. The judge, Judge Waterman, part of these 30 page jury instructions we've been talking about the last couple of days was to go down the list of charges from the top. So the jury worked through that. They said it was not a first degree intentional homicide case. They agreed unanimously, clearly. Then they went down to second degree. They Look at the, the, the verbiage, uh, the law around uh, second degree intentional homicide, his claims of self-defense. They found him not guilty. The third count underneath that was first degree reckless homicide. And that is what they are convicting him on, on the top count. Similar situation. Uh, we don't have a full screen to show you, but on the stabbing victims, those who survived, uh, they did not find guilty. Uh, they did, they uh, acquitted him on the top counts there of the first and second degree attempted intentional homicide, instead finding him guilty on charges of uh, reckless uh, endangerment, recklessly endangering safety. Marsh Hallberg, criminal defense attorney, uh, Hallberg criminal defense has been with us all morning a couple times during this trial. I know we talked about that reckless seemed to be, you know, the sweet spot, if you will, in this case. Um, I'm, I'm a bit surprised in the timing, you know, given the jury, you know, it only spent half a day yesterday, the morning today. I thought if they were coming back this quickly, it would be more of a self-defense finding. Uh, but, but maybe we were right. That reckless count, just uh, given the totality of the circumstances out there, uh, they felt that was the most appropriate for me use actions. I think we, at the risk of uh, sounding modest, right? I think we kind of had a good, pretty good read on this. We watched the whole trial and uh, they, they quickly knocked out that intentional homicide. Uh, so they must have done that very quickly. Just conceptually said, is there anybody here that thinks he intentionally was trying to kill these people? And uh, they knocked that out quickly and then were able to focus on the second half. Uh, it's kind of interesting. I don't think I missed anything just now, but I'm used to a jury uh, when juries return verdicts that we read the, all the counts and each one is not guilty, not guilty, not guilty. Then you get to the guilties. So here it appears they just only read in Wisconsin the uh, guilty forms and they just uh, presume that the others are not guilty because they didn't address them at all. So big difference. The problem we have is you start to get into some really complicated sentencing issues that are now going to come up because 
you've got separate victims. And so you get in this concept of same behavioral act. That is that there was one incident that happened in the river that day within 25 seconds, but there are separate, each one's a separate victim. So you get into the arguments about how the sentences increase because of more than one victim. Do they run concurrent? Do they run consecutive? Uh, are there enhancements that happen? Just an aggravating factor of more than one person being hurt. Uh, all of those types of things can be considered. And Marsh, I'm going to cut you off there. We have more questions. I just want to point out now for our streaming viewers and those of uh, our Fox 9 loyal viewers who are watching our 11 a.m. coverage, I am told now we are uh, simulcasting. We are live streaming and broadcasting in both locations now. So thank you all. Let's reset this case then uh, for everybody uh, to understand what's just happened in the last few minutes. Nikolai Miu, uh, Prior Lake, 54 years old. He has been jailed ever since the July 30th, 2022 uh, encounter on the river with those two birds. Uh, seven days worth of trial, two days, if you will, worth of jury deliberations. Nikolai Miu found guilty up and down the charging, the charges he faced. But I do want to point out, we have to be very careful with our verbiage. He was not found guilty. He was acquitted on the top, top counts. One of those top counts was first degree intentional homicide. A conviction there would have sent him to prison for life. Uh, you just heard Marsh Hallberg, criminal defense attorney, Hallberg criminal defense here in the Twin Cities. He's helping us uh, analyze uh, the fallout, the case. Uh, obviously, uh, Miu now found guilty on six uh, separate charges involving six victims. There's now a sixth victim, if you will. Uh, that is Madison Cohen, uh, the blonde woman, if you followed our trial. Um, uh, there is a count of battery that he was found guilty of. And here on your screen uh, are the most significant charges. Again, we have to reiterate the jury found that this was not an intentional act to kill and injure, but rather a reckless homicide. And with that, Marsh, let me get your opinion again. We talked about the difference between intentional and reckless homicide. I'm thinking of some of the circumstances in this case, the subtle nature by which he pulls out the knife, the fact that he doesn't leave, the fact that he doesn't take a step or two back and hold up the knife. I know legally he doesn't have to do that, but I just think real world, that jury looked at the, his actions in that, even if you narrow it down to 30 seconds on that cell phone video, his behaviors in there, they thought criminal, not self-defense. Right. I mean, you, you piece together all those little things that I thought the state did a, a good job of tying together, especially on their second closing this, when they came back up after the defense, that those little things all add up to give you proof beyond a reasonable doubt was their argument, that, he, that originally Mew approaches them, that he doesn't back off. He has a lot of opportunities to go other locations. I think that knife location ended up being one of those little details that was important to everybody. The fact that he opened it without even looking down, because that would have caused jurors to also look down to have seen it. He never brandished it, never said back off, uh, kind of, and that he overreacted, right? Uh, that he just kind of freaked out in in the moment. Uh, and as we talked about, you don't you can form intent in a, in a second. I can decide to kill somebody in just a moment. I don't need to plan for it for days or weeks to make that happen. So you can be found guilty of intentional first degree homicide when you act just in the moment. But here they're just saying there was never intent to do that. He wanted to get him to move, get out of his space, to move away, and that there was never an intent to actually kill anybody. You just feel, Marsh, you just think about all the circumstances that led to that that moment in the river, uh, the lost cell phone, me you sort of um, oddly, if you will, putting on donning goggles and snorkel to, 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 to search for the phone and, you know, six inch, you know, 10 inch uh, depth of water, the, the initial encounter with the boys, their behavior is not to be excused that day. I mean, tragically, they lost a, a dear friend, uh, a young man with, uh, with a bright, bright future by all accounts, Isaac Schumann. Uh, but, uh, uh, you know, as, as that confrontation kind of gets ginned up between me, you and the teenage boys, you have that other group of tubers, the 20 somethings uh, or so that are drinking, that think they're just going over to play peacemaker and, and trying to separate the, the, the old man, if you will, from the young boys who are kind of out of control, you know, doing, you know, shooting their videos and stuff. And that's in the end that that scenario, those in particular, Madison Cohen and Riley Madison coming over. Uh, to sort of get in between um, Nikolai Miu and the boys, it would escalate from there. And, and Miu, I mean, no one's saying he shouldn't have had a knife that day on the tube, uh, on the river. It, as we learned, it's, it's used to cut string, cut rope. It's a tool you would have on the river that all of a sudden, in his mind, he did fear for his, for his life and for his safety. But this jury just said, uh, uh, Miu, um, 
acted criminally, that he, he didn't need to kill, he did not need to injure. I'm just wondering how you assess sort of the, the, the facts in this case. Well, part of it, Paul, like we, talk, we all have done this in our lives, right? The what if game that what if Mew's friend hadn't called him and said, hey, bring your knife so we have something to cut the twine, that he hadn't had a knife with him that day. What if they'd been 10 minutes earlier or later getting onto that river that they may not have interacted with the, with the young group of tubers? You know, what if I had just walked away? What if I didn't care about the phone? It's there, somebody else's phone, let them find it. I mean, Mr. Mew will sit in prison and ask himself those questions endlessly. And on the other side, too, the young people involved are constantly going to go, why did we, you know, kind of egg everybody on? And why did we drink too much? And why, did, why, why, why? And we have one of our best friends who's now dead and can't ever bring them back. So that's, that's going to haunt both sides forever about why didn't we do something differently? It, it really is a haunting case and even taking it to circumstances even kind of one step further from that I you know I recall Isaac Schumann's mom's testimony he was supposed to golf that morning he was supposed to be out golfing with a friend he wasn't available his dad was flying in from the airport uh, there was a chance Isaac was going to go be the one to pick him up but mom said no your friends are going to the river go go have fun I mean you heard uh, other testimony uh, his friend Ariel who lost the cell phone telling Nikolai not to worry about it it's it's insured I don't even care just let it go. Let's just enjoy our day. There's so many sort of moments in this, you know, the Apple River. I mean, it's, it is a magnet. Let's be frank. It is a magnet for young partying, uh, drinking, uh, um, that revelry. Uh, but it is also a family outing. People enjoy lazily going down that river with the family. We heard testimony from a nurse who's on the river just by circumstance that day uh, with her family. But for that situation to just you know, whether it's devolve or escalate to, to, to the loss of life, it just seems it just seems so tragic. It's one of the things that will haunt me after covering this trial, gavel to gavel. Yeah, I just everyone's heart has to go out to Isaac's mother that you never want to outlive your children. I can't in, in I don't know if there's anything worse to experience for someone than outliving your children, especially in a tragic death like this. And again, she's doing that what if question. What if I hadn't said go pick up your dad, you know? Or I said, do pick up your dad and, and don't go to the river. And, and so she'll second guess that her whole life. So you have people whose lives are ruined and will think about this for the rest of their lives, not just Mr. Mew, but everybody else. And it just, it if we all hopefully draw wisdom from this, right? To say, just just recognize that you get in a road rage situation, just drive away. Don't, don't you know, flip somebody off or pick a fight at a bar or, you know, confront somebody over a stupid cell phone. It, it costs people lives and it, it's just, it's so sad. I know it's a Wisconsin case, impossible to tell at this point whether that, those are unique circumstances or if that, this is a precedential type of case in terms of arguing self-defense. And, you know, in that moment, I do think some people in the cell phone video watching the Jawan Cockfield cell phone video see, gosh, if I was in that position, I'd pull out whatever I had. Maybe after getting knocked down, what if I pulled up a rock and had chucked yeah. it at, 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 at the group or something and accidentally killed somebody? Um, you know, obviously, it's still very early on. Uh, as we process this, but uh, going back to our, our, our the, the headline here, of course, Ryan, let's show the uh, the charge again, the murder charge charges and how this jury uh, found uh, today their unanimous verdict, finding uh, Nikolai Miu guilty. Oh, I'm being I'm going to be interrupted here. I'm I'm being told that one of uh, Nikolai Miu's defense attorneys task, is at the podium. Let's listen in. Is Aaron Nelson? We obviously, you know, disagree. Uh, you know. So with deep sadness. How's Nikolai doing? What was his reaction to how it really worked out? Uh, he's, uh, I thought, a, a showed appropriate emotion throughout. You know, he's had a, a deep sadness. And uh, as he said on the initial tape to the police, he said, you know, he was sorry. Uh, I know when this case uh, first started and there was talks about what we could do to help alleviate some of the uh, stress and pain uh, that other people were feeling. We did what we could in that moment, and I think that was a large part because uh, Nick wanted to take the lead on that, and so uh, he continues to feel those feelings. He's sad, obviously disappointed in the result, and um, you know, contemplating his future life. Did he tell you anything? Uh, I told us lots of things. Uh, shared what I wanted. Okay. These charges were added on at the end. That's something the public's, you know, that 
aren't used to trials may not completely understand. Can you touch on that as well as like what kind of penalties he could be facing now? Yeah, yeah, so he was originally charged with intentional crimes. Um, by deduction, it, uh, it seems like he was found, they couldn't agree on the intentional crime, so they moved on to the reckless, and that's what he was charged with. Reckless crimes are a lesser included offense of the intentional crimes. There's still substantial life-changing penalties that he faces. What was your thought coming into today when you walked in the courthouse? Did you feel good about the case? You know, like, uh, we felt like we had a good case. We felt like we had a good defense. We felt like we put on a good defense. Um, but in many ways, self-defense is a community standard, and it's very dependent upon which group of 12 people within the community you ask. Uh, I understand and appreciate that. Um, we had a lot of complex feelings going in. We felt confident, um, but we're also aware that it's, it's not math. It's not black and white. It's a, it's a community standard. Were you expecting a verdict today when you walked in? Did you think it would take longer for them to get to something? No real expectations, whatever. With juries are unpredictable, so. All right. Thank you. And those who might not have watched our ongoing gavel to gavel coverage, that is Aaron Nelson, uh, Nikolai Miu's lead uh, defense counsel. Obviously, he's saying there they disagree uh, with the verdict. Uh, it is with deep sadness, though, that they accept. Uh, again, we're trying to process this all. Wisconsin, not necessarily a state we deal with uh, every day in terms of the uh, fallout, given the guilty uh, verdicts here on the uh, prison uh, potential for Mr. Miu. He is being jailed until sentencing. I will point out he has been jailed since July 30th, 2022. So he has been in custody at the county jail there uh, in Hudson, Wisconsin since. He will remain there until sentencing. But the way um, Aaron Nelson described it is significant life-changing um, uh, amounts of time ahead for me, you in prison. And before I toss it out to my colleague Rob Olson at the courthouse, I do just want to point out one other thing. He said Aaron Nelson describing self-defense as a, quote, community standard, meaning what do others, others need to weigh in and process whether um, it was self-defense. Miu and his legal team clearly believe what happened that day was an act of self-defense. Pulling out the knife and stabbing the five others was meant to save and protect, save his own life and protect himself. But clearly 12 residents of St. Croix County said no, what happened there was criminal. With that, Rob Olson has been at this trial throughout on the ground at the St. Croix County Courthouse. He is outside now. Rob, take me inside the courtroom at the time of this verdict. Uh, at the time of the verdict, yes, uh, this uh, you could tell something different was happening here uh, before we got word officially that it was a verdict coming, uh, you know, because they unlocked the courtroom as they would do for juror questions. Uh, but in this case, uh, a lot of deputies uh, appeared in the hallway and uh, it took longer to uh, to get everybody organized and in. And they said we have to get organized inside. So you kind of had the sense that this would be the verdict. So uh, it was a, a crowded area waiting to get in once inside. You know, if you've been in a courtroom for any uh, type of verdict, which we've we've done many of those, and there's a different sense, obviously, in there of that, um, uh, just much more uh, attention, obviously, and anticipation about what's coming. Uh, when the initial guilty verdict was read for first degree reckless homicide, again, one of the lesser included charges, but still a first degree charge. Uh, then you had the, the audible gasps from the, the left side of the courtroom, and that is where Isaac Schumann's family and friends and, and friends of some of the others uh, were sitting, but a large contingent here from uh, uh, representing Isaac Schumann, the young man who was killed on the Apple River now nearly two years ago. So clearly that was, you know, I, I couldn't get a sense of, of beyond that, but... but um, uh, but but there was an emotional reaction to hearing that guilty verdict. And then as the other guilty verdicts came in, as you mentioned too, and as we've talked about, again, these are the lesser included charges that were added in uh, before the closing arguments. This is not uncommon. You know, people may think, well, that's, that's weird. That happens, um, particularly in, in cases where attorneys may feel that, that, um, that maybe they, there needs to be some options for juries. Sometimes you do go into trials 
with several levels of options for the jury, and sometimes those are added in at the request of the prosecutors, sometimes defense attorneys, uh, during or, or uh, at the end of a trial, at the end of the testimony phase, which is what happened here. So these guilty verdicts are, again, still first-degree uh, uh, verdicts here for uh, reckless homicide and recklessly endangering safety, uh, which includes, you know, while using a dangerous weapon, and then battery, which was added in uh, uh, late too. But still first-degree uh, guilty verdicts here, but again, the lesser charges that doesn't take or that takes out the intent and uh, which then uh, takes out the self-defense uh, part of it too. But intent is the big one. The, uh, the first and second degree homicide uh, were intentional homicide charges, meaning that he intended. And the attorneys will tell you that intent uh, can be formed in an instant. This isn't like premeditation. Intent can be at the moment that you did this, you intended, and prosecutors really trying to prove intent here because of the nature of the injuries. These were stab uh, wounds uh, that were two vital organs in the case of Isaac Schumann going through a couple of ribs and, and nicking uh, the apex of the heart. So their argument there is if you are stabbing in that manner, uh, certainly one of the possibilities is death, and therefore that is an intent to kill. Uh, whether that was going through your mind in that moment or not, the action itself has that as a potential outcome, and so therefore that is the intent. That's what prosecutors were trying to prove there. And, uh, but clearly the jury decided reckless homicide, uh, which was, was the more appropriate, and recklessly endangering safety was the more appropriate level here of verdict. The self-defense claim was interesting here. People wonder too, the difference between those, the top two charges, which again, they didn't rule on uh, going down to the third, but the first and second degree intentional murder, the difference there is, is uh, if uh, first degree intentional murder, uh, if they had found him guilty on that, that meant the jury would have said, we don't believe your claim of self-defense. If they had found him guilty on the second degree intentional murder, the jury would have been indicating uh, there, we believe you felt you were acting in self-defense, but we don't believe you needed to act in self-defense. Uh, but again, those were not ruled on. They moved down to the third. And the way that the judge instructed them is they start at the top charge, the highest level charge, and then move down. So they would have to basically have a unanimous not guilty vote on this charge. Uh, if they had a unanimous guilty on the top charge, they're done. They move on to the, the uh, other counts. Um, but in this case, it would be a unanimous not guilty on the first and then the second, and then unanimous on the third charge, which was, again, in the case of Isaac Schumann. Uh, a large contingent, as I said, in the courtroom of friends and family. We've seen that, especially last week, uh, when the victims were testifying, a lot of friends were here and a lot of family members were here in the courtroom. Uh, not so much as it got into some of the defense witnesses, but a very, very uh, large contingent here today. When they came out of the courtroom, they all entered into a, a conference room here on the first floor of the courthouse. We expect that they will be coming out and somebody will be uh, talking to us. Uh, again, don't have that exactly confirmed who that would be and when, but there is an expectation that someone will. I did speak with uh, Nikolai Mayu's brother, Miu's brother, pardon me, uh, outside the courtroom uh, right after the verdict. It's his fraternal twin brother uh, and his only sibling. And uh, he just said, no, there would be no one from their, their family making a statement. Not yet, not at this point. He departed, as did uh, now uh, Miu's uh, ex-wife. Their divorce finalized just before the trial. And what the attorneys indicated uh, to the judge during the trial is that that was um, for not for relationship reasons, but for other uh, legal and financial reasons. Potentially, uh, that happens to protect assets of a spouse. Uh, in this case, uh, they didn't elaborate, but they just said it was not relationship reasons, but but financial reasons. Uh, but she departed, did not want to talk, covering her face. And again, Nikolai Mayu's uh, twin brother and others also did not want to have any comments. Um, we see some of the friends of Isaac Schumann here uh, departing now. Uh, not, not electing to speak with us either, but again, a lot of them were here. Um, we will certainly come back as soon as somebody does uh, speak to us out here. And uh, for now, though, uh, Paul will send it back to you.
And, and Rob, I'm just curious, those friends you mentioned, you, you messaged us uh, as you were heading into the court that they were the first ones that might have tipped you off, that a verdict was in. Uh, are we talking some of the witness friends, some of the kids who were on the river that day? Can you tell? Do you, do you recognize faces? Uh, did they come back to hear the verdict? No. no. Uh, they were not. Um, they were uh, friends of, of Isaac. And, uh, yeah, as we're waiting outside, um, waiting for official confirmation, but obviously everybody's showing up because they've been told why, and they just said, is, is verdict what you've been told? And they said, yes, that's what we have heard. And then 30 seconds later, I got the confirmation from a sheriff's deputy, too. So, um, but, yeah, a number of them there, they were not witnesses on the stand, though. Yeah, I'm just kind of wondering their emotions today now. You know, the, I think there is an acknowledgement of their behavior that day and uh, how it all escalated uh, from there. We know Isaac was well loved. The memorial services we covered in the days that followed, uh, there was a huge outpouring. Just wondering, I mean, we, we the camera did pan away afterwards. Uh, obviously, we saw what the defendant's reaction. Just looking at the Isaac's family or, or the friends, uh, what did you see reaction to the verdict? I mean, was it a, a weight being lifted? Was it a motion? Did, did, you, did you make any observations in court? It was, uh, it was very subdued, again, after the initial guilty verdict of reckless homicide for Isaac Schumann. Then that was, you know, uh, audible just gasps of, of emotion. Beyond that, though, no, uh, still remaining pretty stoic in there. Um, you know, uh, so after that, no, no other reactions that I visibly saw. All right. Rob Olson, Fox 9 reporter at the courthouse in Hudson for us. Thank you so much. And we'll come back to you just as soon as uh, one of the other parties steps out uh, to the microphone uh, to speak. Uh, but obviously, um, huge news today. Nikolai Miu found guilty on multiple counts, as Rob reports there. Lesser charges, not intentional criminal acts, but rather reckless Act. So we can put the, uh, the, the charges, uh, the findings uh, on your screen. Uh, we do have our legal analyst standing by, Marsh Hallberg. Uh, Marsh, one thing that uh, came to me that I just found a really um, enlightening statement from Aaron Nelson, uh, Miu's defense attorney, was this idea that self-defense is, quote, a community standard. No doubt Nikolai Miu is back in his cell thinking what I did that day, I did to protect myself. I did, I, I knew or I felt my life was in danger. I did what I needed to do. 12 jurors said, no, it was not self-defense. There were other alternatives. I'm just uh, I'm gonna ask you for your reaction to that, just that verbiage that Aaron Nelson used, that self-defense is a community standard. Well, in the sense that it's, I think the instruction is reasonable and you know, ordinary prudent people, you know, kind of the, what their standard is and those are going to be the people that are on the jury right and how they would act so as, you know maybe our our uh, level of uh weariness might be greater in a you know dark alley in a big city versus uh, being out on a beautiful day on a very open public waterway right so uh they're gonna look at the not only how they react but in what context that it was a this was not that threatening a location that again the state kept pounding away he could have just turned and they showed shots of lots of open water and pathways to have just moved away but his sense of dignity and he was angered by the names he's being called he's repulsed by these kind of loudmouth intoxicated young people and chose to stand there and again they don't have any stand your ground issue here but he chose to just not walk away you know those the, the defense attorneys i can tell you that being a trial lawyer is a really hard job it's a fascinating job and very fulfilling but those defense lawyers are just exhausted. Uh, it's like you take a baseball bat in the stomach. They are so tired. You go back and go, why do we do this job? Yeah. <laughs> it is so hard. It is so exciting. It's so exhausting. And here we are. We, we just lost the big game, right? And uh, so I feel for them. And this, the state's exhausted as well, but they've got a victory to show for that. And, uh, you know, very substantial consequences coming for Mr. Mio. And Marsh, as you've talked about, uh, again, this is Marsh Hallberg, uh, Hallberg Criminal Defense, a local Twin Cities attorney weighing in uh, with some legal analysis, uh, some fast knee jerk uh, kind of reaction uh, as we, we take in uh, this verdict that we just heard from. It's on the prosecution side. You talked about win, lose. Is this a victory? Like, will they come out? What will be their posture? This is right, this is justice, or will they feel they let the community down and that they did not get him on the top counts? No, they're going to be they're going to be pleased with that. Uh, 
I, I call throwaway charges, and it's, it's not that weak, but sometimes the, go the government will put in charges they don't intend to win. They want to win, they hope to win, but they're not going to be surprised they don't. And I've got to believe that, in that sense, the first-degree homicide, intentional homicide charges were throwaways in the sense of, we're going we're gonna to throw those out there, they can find them not guilty of that, feel good about that, and then give them the charges we think we're far more likely to win on. And, and that shows the tactic, as Rob had also mentioned from the courthouse, the defense can ask for lesser included. And sometimes I will do that or our team will do that. We'll go into a case and somebody's charged with a, a higher crime and we want something less. So we're the ones asking for a lesser included offense to be added because we want to give the jury an option to do something less if we feel we're not going to make it out unscathed. And it's not malpractice or anything to shoot for the stars on the first degree intentional. The state really believed in their mind it was an intentional. As they described in their closing arguments, very deliberate acts. Yes, there was poor, disgusting behavior going on on the river that day directed at Miu. But they, in their mind, they did see it as intentional and, and they charged it that way. Right. I, th I, I assume the state managed expectations through their victim advocates and any communications with the victim's families that... Um, and the victims that survived that, you know, first degree intentional is a real stretch. We think it can be there, it's possible, but recognize that may not happen. When the camera was showing the, uh, the spectators reacting to the verdict, they didn't seem surprised that they weren't hearing guilties on the intentional homicide cases. So it kind of makes me think they recognized that that wasn't gonna be there, but you've got all these other counts that are there. And again, minor ones like the battery case are, are uh, and not a big deal. And just a little footnote on that for people. And you know, we always talk about here about assault and battery. And this is called a battery charge. If you go into old English law and different states handle it different ways, assault, assault can just be causing fear of harm to somebody where I don't actually touch them. And battery is where I physically touch someone. So there's assault is where you may have words, fighting words, something like that, versus harm where you, by touching somebody. So this is a battery charge. You and I have agreed, uh, Nikolai Miu got wonderful counsel. The attorneys really did a, did a nice job with the case. I know everyone's going to look now with 2020 hindsight. Did you feel they left anything on the table? Was there anything else you missed in their case? Like, ooh, there, there was one other thing I could have seen. Uh, you, you think there was anything missed? No. I, I mean, again, we all... Well, second guess, so I could ask this different question or less questions or more questions, but they did both sides did a really good job of trying to put in their case. Very different styles, you know, which is usual. States more business-like, less uh, dramatic, uh, less emotional on their whole, here's the facts, here's the law, we win. The defense tended to be a little more uh, emotionally based on this case. And I know you don't try cases in Wisconsin, so I don't want to put you on the spot with anything specific, but I'm, I'm, my guess is you could talk loosely about this. Aaron Nelson, Muse lead criminal defense attorney, describing the, quote, substantial life-changing penalties await uh, Miu. I, I don't want to put you on the spot for what he would be looking at, but maybe talk about what, what happens now. I believe it's similar to Minnesota with a pre-sentence investigation. Uh, would sentencings, what, be six weeks out? What would be your gut on how this next phase would play out? Right. Uh, well, first, if somebody is convicted of uh, uh, first-degree homicide, at least Minnesota in there, if you've got a presumptive life sentence, they can move to sentencing right then because there's no need for to learn more about the defendant or do probation interviews or get any other put. If the sentence is life, the sentence is life. And move. You can, so right after a jury verdict on a murder one conviction, intentional murder one conviction, you can move right to sentencing in that moment. Here, because we have a reckless homicide, they're going to do it someplace called a PSI, is a common abbreviation pre-sentence investigation take usually at least six to eight weeks unless there's some kind of psychological testing done which I don't see here uh, and that's to do this very long intensive report about Mr. Mew for the judge he's learned a lot hearing the whole case so he knows more than you do in most cases because in most cases do not go to trial but here you learn all about his finances his background his criminal history uh, and he's he's learned all about it at the case uh, at, in the trial uh, sometimes defense lawyers we talk about the you know, the, the trial penalty or the trial tax, in that although you have the right to go to trial and you have the presumption of innocence, when you exercise that right, the negative of that can be that the judge learns a lot more about the case than they otherwise would know. You know, hearing about all the, the victims or the mother of Isaac in the courtroom, having that in his head when you move to sentencing. Uh, maybe him going up there going, I'm not believing Mr. Mew on this stuff and he has the right to say it, but it's, it's not impressing me. So sometimes you, you 
can get a worse sentence when you go to trial and lose than uh, if you just took a plea deal. And again, to reset our coverage here, it's 1146 Central Time. Nikolai Miu found guilty up and down uh, on the charges, but on lesser included uh, crimes, uh, not found guilty, acquitted on all counts related to intentional criminal acts. We have the uh, full screens uh, to show you, uh, to, to remind our, our late joining viewers and then those on our stream about what we are talking about specifically. Nikolai Miu here. Again, on the first, on the, on the, on the murder charge, found gu guilty of first degree reckless homicide. And now these are the four stabbing victims. They acquitted him on attempted intentional first degree murder and attempted second degree murder, but found him guilty up and down on the four victims now. A.J. Martin, Riley Madison, and then the Carlson brothers, Anthony Tony. And then Dante and, and Mars, I would just ask, you know, we talked about could could a jury come back and find self-defense in one case, not the other. One of the young men maybe stabbed uh, less, you know, the injury uh, less significant here they, they did find guilty counts and they seem to keep everybody at that same reckless level. Uh, your yeah. assessment of that. Yeah, I think part of that's uh, reflective in how quickly they came back. I mean, what, six, eight hours of deliberation on so many counts and so many people? They did some big box decisions about all in or all out. So I think they grouped all those people together and made some quick decisions. Was clearly, they could have. That's why this could have taken many days if they wanted to bore down on each victim, each charge, and try to decide some may be guilty of a higher offense than, than mm -hmm. others. Marsh, I know we've been kind of referring back to our uh, kind of live stream poll numbers on our YouTube live stream where thousands of you are joining us. So we appreciate that. Uh, we're running a poll. 2000 plus have now voted. Uh, do you agree with the verdict? 54 percent say no. So a slight majority. 46 percent say yes, we agree with the verdict. And Marsh, it is just another aspect of this case that is that divides this community, you know, whether it's generational, how you look at it, whose lens you're looking it through. But it seems every time we ask a question, half thinks one way, half thinks the other. Maybe that's just where we are in society. Certainly Wisconsin is a a black and white state right down the middle. So maybe it shouldn't surprise us that, uh, the, the, that the way our viewers are processing this verdict is half and half. Yeah, isn't it a sign of our times, right? In all world events and politics and everything else, we can all see the same supposedly you know, facts and we come up with completely different decisions. And that applies in this case. Both sides preached how, gosh, we're so glad we've got this video because it's gonna show you that we should win. And so this is an example, everybody watches the same video and they, we see two different things, self-defense or, or reckless homicide. I know we've asked, what, what does this case look like if there was no video, if this was just per people account, witness accounts versus one another? Do you, do you have a thought on where we would be if there, were no, if there was no cell phone video in the middle of that river that day? Which, if you think about it in the water, maybe, maybe someone doesn't have the, the phone out or doesn't have the foresight yeah. to take it out. Uh, just uh, without video, what happens with this case? Yeah, my, my thought was before we even started the trial at the very beginning that if you, know, you could snap your fingers and create a different set of facts, if I was Mr. Mew, I would rather not have had the video uh, because, you know, granted, you could have all these other people saying, here's what he did or didn't do, that he hit Ms. Madison, et cetera. But the distances between him and some of the others, the, like I said, holding the knife down and kind of not secretly, but subtly opening the blade. Uh, the ability the views of the water where he could have escaped to or moved to to get away from this. I think in, if I had to pick one side or the other, that video helped the state more than it did the defense. And then the only other what if I, I, I want to know your opinion on if he had sort of more owned it in the moment. And then, you know, I understand wanting to walk away or get away from what would have been a hostile situation. But at the river's exit, somewhere stepping aside, handing over the knife, kind of being upfront about it, did, would you have seen, if everything else happened as it did, if he had just owned it, given up the knife, explained what he was seeing, would this have been charged? Would we have maybe just ended up right back here with a reckless murder count? Yeah, I thought the state did one of their best things, I thought was the fact of saying, this man is a smart man, high, higher educated degrees, speaks a number of languages, he is smart, and he's, a, and he's also a really good liar. 
because he didn't know the video existed when he first was saying stories about there were two knives, he turned one blade around on somebody, he was being held, his pants were being pulled down, and the state did a good job of going through lie after lie after lie. And the, the point was, he's going to lie to create a story that can fit what his defense now is today. So some things he can't escape, he's got to just say he lied, because the video doesn't show what he claims happened. But on the facts we don't know for sure, he's going to, to do nuanced positioning of his statement to try to now fit a self-defense item. And I think the state did a really good job about it. He's had two years to figure out what he wants to now say. We're hearing some things for the first time today on the stand because he knows his BS story before this didn't work. So now uh, he's got to shave that to make it fit the jury instructions. All right, Marsh, I'll give you the last word. I know you have to run to court, but... Uh... You know, our system has its warts, but uh, this was justice. This is a community decision. Uh, was, was justice served over these last two weeks in Hudson, Wisconsin? I think it was a fair case. I think it was a good case. Now, they're always going to maybe try to appeal. And sometimes, quite frankly, we try cases planning for the appeal. We plan to lose at the state level, but we think there's some bigger, deeper issue that is cutting new ground on whether a statement should be admissible or some kind of scientific testing or something is appropriate for a trial. And sometimes you say, based upon what the jury's going to get, we're going to lose. But we think an appellate court might agree there's evidence in this case that shouldn't have been heard by a jury. I didn't see that here. The video is what it is. They've got that. And uh, we've got the statements, you know, proper uh, brandizing and that kind of stuff. So uh, I think it was a fair case. Yeah, the only thing I could quickly think of, as you mentioned, the interrogation there at the end, obviously the defense fought to keep that out, saying he at least alluded to wanting an attorney. Uh, that did come in in its entirety. Obviously, self-defense, that's hard to appeal. You heard Aaron Nelson acknowledge there at the end that that really is a community uh, a community yeah. standard. And the only other thing that really in the pretrial motions that I kind of uh, had read through was uh, the defense had tried to keep out the up until the 225 mark of the video, i.e. after the stabbing, sort of the aftermath, the river running uh, blood red, uh, uh, Juwan Cockfield turning the phone to his face, kind of, um, you know, the panic in that moment that that could be prejudicial for their client. The judge allowed it to be played audio full. Clearly, in the end, the jury just wanted to see the sections around uh, the stabbings and uh, the, the interaction between Miu and Madison Cohen. But that pretrial decision, I suppose, could be appealed the interrogation. But otherwise, yeah, I'd agree with you, Marsh. It seemed like a pretty buttoned up uh, case on both sides. Yeah, appeal is going to be tough because they've got so much other evidence, even if, you know, they were to say that wasn't overly prejudicial, like the showing the blood in the water, for example, right? You still have every one of these young people that testified about what they saw, what they saw happened. Um, you know, it's going to be a tough appeal to try to win. Marsh Hallberg, Hallberg Criminal Defense, thank you so much for walking us through today's uh, fast evolving uh, day. Um, I appreciate you and perhaps we will see you as we get closer to sentencing. Uh, we're going to wrap up our coverage here on our Fox 9 digital platforms. Maybe one last look uh, at the convictions. This St. Croix County jury finding Nikolai Miu guilty up and down the charges, but again on the lesser end of the spectrum, not intentional. So here, as it relates to the stabbing death of Isaac Schumann, Nikolai Miu found guilty of first degree reckless homicide. As for the stabbing victims, those who survived, including badly injured A.J. Martin, Riley Madison, and then the Carlson brothers, they did not find him guilty. They acquitted him on the attempted intentional homicides, but found him guilty for each and every one of these four, first degree, recklessly endangering safety. And finally, one final guilty count, a much uh, lighter charge, if you will, but battery, Madison Cohen, the blonde woman. It was the physical altercation between him and her, me, you, Cohen, Cohen's friend next to her, Riley Madison, that physical confrontation there, sparking the deadly onset of violence on the Apple River, July 30th, 2022. The jury finding Nikolai Miu guilty of battery. With that, that wraps up our coverage for now. We were hoping to perhaps hear from the district attorney 
uh, perhaps Isaac Schumann's loved ones. Uh, but as we keep an eye on our camera outside the courthouse, uh, that has just not occurred yet. So we're going to say goodbye for now. Of course, coverage throughout the day online at Fox9.com and throughout all evening newscasts. You saw Rob Olson is there gathering reaction to, a, to what really is a, a stunning day. But again, from all of us here at Fox 9 making this possible, thank you so much for watching our live stream coverage of the Apple River stabbing trial. I am Paul Bloom for now. Good afternoon.